world. Welcome to the uh, second episode. Today uh, I got my friend here, Tom McNamara, and I hope I didn't butcher it. No, you got it. Is that how you pronounce it? McNamara. Ma- there you go. It's, I never it's, like pronounce your last name. Yeah, I know. It's MC, but it, you gotta go Mac on it. Well, we got MC Mac here. Make killing it. I forgot to say what you are, uh, apart from being a cool homie. You're a DOP. We've worked together in the past. Yeah. And uh, I think we should work together again. It's gonna happen. <laughs> but yeah, so welcome to the podcast. Hey, I'm a, it's a pleasure being here. Mm-hmm. Second, uh, second guest of all time. It's funny. Here's here's what I was gonna plug very Go first. Go for thing. it. You didn't ask me if this was my good side. Oh. And <laughs> it's actually not. But I don't care. And what's funny is I had a guy last week. This big time fucking. Uh, this, You're allowed to swear. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I <laughs> it's said, encouraged. I, I knew I could. It's encouraged. This this dude, uh, this big time like kind of cosmetics dude from LA. We were doing like, a series of ads in studio, yeah. and the, for the whole day he was walking around. He was in studio. We were shooting him last. We were shooting a series of like it was crappy like demonstrations of cosmetic stuff. Those are so fun. I shot one yesterday. D- really? They're so That's not fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's you know, yeah, it's basic. Yeah. There there was some cool stuff like. The day after, kind of thing, but it was, well, it was kind of just yeah, so, straightforward. So, just back to your story, what but, happened? Uh, but uh, yeah, he was there the whole day, and I was lighting from one side, right? The key light was coming from one side the entire day. He saw that, he saw yeah. my setup, and I had to leave at five. I went to go and see the Smashing Pumpkins oh, at the Bell Center last sick. week. And uh, I had to leave at five, because I had a whole like, restaurant thing or whatever. So it's 4.58, I, we were ready to do his stuff. I was okay. just gonna set it up for my people, La Relève, and I was gonna leave. And at 4.58, he goes, oh, by the way, oh um, I need the key light absolutely, and all my videos has to come from the other side, because oh, that's my good side, because my nose, blah, blah, blah. He, he threw all this shit at me, and I was like, oh, where is 4.58 right now? <laughs> First of all, but, the uh, fact that a thing like that is so important to your existence, to me, yeah. your existence is kind of weird. It but is, second of all, <laughs> if it's that important, like... Maybe more than a two-minute heads up would be nice. He was in the shots prior to that, just oh. like as a quick little thing. But he saw yeah. the whole setup and knew that it wouldn't be good for his face. But anyway, it, it really struck me because I never really worked with anyone who like that really mattered to. Yeah. And I didn't know who I was really mad at because I was I reacted the same way as you. You're like fuck that like, guy, or whatever. But uh, I was like, it, it is his trade. It's I important guess. for him. It's I get. It's true. Yeah, it's important. Like in, yeah, that, yeah. that means that means that in every single one of his oh, insta God, photos. In every single one of his Insta photos and whatever else, he always makes sure that the stronger light is coming from the right side. That's crazy. Yeah. So I was kind of a bit pissed, but then impressed. At the yeah. Time. I was like, hmm. But but like, work ethic wise, like if you know that it's so yeah. much a thing, like every single Instagram shot you're taking is like this side and not that side. That's ninja level stuff. Man. Like, yeah, but you should know to communicate that, right? Because it's yeah. so important. Like, yeah. I find I've been working like. I'm, I'm freelance, right? And like one of the things that I've learned over the last like couple years is just so like how important all the little details are to actually getting work, like your communications. Yeah. Like when there's like a miscommunication on set, like how do you resolve it? How like are you effective at like like this thing? He should have communicated that early. Like if it's that important. But then you know it's really right. Like who is like the onus of that is on who because. I guess when I set it up the day before, yeah. I should have asked like the project manager, whoever was in charge of that, who communicates with him. Yeah. Should I have asked that? I don't know, because I usually do it from one side. Do you know? And uh, practically, it comes from that side, yeah. just for space stuff. But then I'm like, I, I don't know if I guess I learned something as a DP, because then course, I guess maybe exactly. that feeds into my communication. Because from now on, I'm always. Did you ever think that? Did you ever um, listen to this guy called? He passed on Rogan, uh, Jocko Jocko Wells, I think, or Wells. Uh, or I know not the guy sure. you're talking about. Like, like Navy a, Seal, self improvement kind of guy. Exactly. He's like an ex Navy Seal, and his thing is oh, like yeah. absolute self responsibility. Yeah. Uh, I forget his exact term for it, but that's basically what it is. It's as a good leader, like. Your everything is your responsibility. Like when you're in charge, it's your res- so you could take the responsibility of being like, hmm, I guess in the future I should have asked this guy. It would have been avoided if I would have asked this guy yeah. any preferences in terms of lighting. Is this all right? And then that wouldn't have that mistake wouldn't have happened. And like just basically adopting that like attitude of everything is your responsibility kind of thing. Like owning up to yeah. whatever yeah. fuck ups there are, and instead of blaming people, like finding a way in you that's, to fix it. That's what. Yeah. I think that's sick. I think that's yeah. like very like true. at first I was like burned because of the yeah, 458 course, thing, and I was like, God damn it! But then you know later on throughout the night, because I got I got to where I needed to go, it was yeah. fine. Like 
I mean, I, I kind of had to do a quick fix, which like I'm uh, like like any other DP, like kind of a perfectionist. Like of I don't course. think that makes me any more special, but like <laughs> I had to do a quick fix instead of yeah. You know what I mean? Because I had to get it done now because they they had a lot of stuff to get through and there was like a prompter and all this stuff and I had to still had to leave. Yeah. I didn't want to make it too late, so I just kind of you know. I, it was a quick fix instead of something that was really like massage yeah, to sure. perfection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, later on in the evening when everything was good, I did think like, you know what? Instead of being kind of angry about it or whatever, because I'm at where I'm at, where I have to be. Yeah. I guess I can add that to the game. Totally. I add that, and that's cool. I, I have that. And then it's like along the lines of what you said, like the leadership thing. Th- like I had this, uh, this. Uh, I think like my biggest. I think I guess like early influence in cinematography anyway yeah. is my teacher uh, Till Newman. He was this German cinematography teacher in my second year in New York, cool. and he would always, always, always say it all comes from the top, and then he would just yeah. vanish. And, I was like, <laughs> and uh, so he's a mystical German. He is. He is. He would drop nuggets like that here and there. He would have the perfect sentence and then just. Walk and then away. as soon as you're thinking about it and he's out of eye line, like he just yeah, disappears. Yeah, exactly. Like, That's what he would do. Mystical. And like, so he would always say it comes from the top, and he would say that in reference to like student true, projects and stuff. But any time there was a chink in the armor at the top, yeah. whatever it is, it like it resonates down It gets down amplified there. downwards. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes when there's some kind of thing going wrong at the bottom of the pyramid, you can CSI your yeah. way back up to the top <laughs> and go, you know what? It's because the leader didn't back yeah. down the hatches on this thing. Yeah. And uh, on set ever, is where you see that at its oh, finest. Man, yeah. Did you, did you ever go, did you ever like, were you ever on a set where just the dynamics became cancer? Like people are always yeah. like pissed and on edge and like, yeah, I did this one. You can often unlocked. trace it back to <laughs> <laughs> you prick. <laughs> you can yeah. always trace it back to the top, right? All, you can all the always time. trace. Yeah. Sure, there's like there's a couple bad apples on the bottom. There's always bad apples, but those bad apples yeah. are just hypersensitive people who will like they won't respond well to issues. But the issues yeah. often come from the top, like because yeah. well, I don't know, like it's there's issues everywhere. Of course, like everyone's gonna have fuck ups, and, and like where do you find the balance between like the fuck up, like is the fuck up on top worse than the fuck up on the bottom like there's bigger consequences if you fuck up on top right yeah. if you're on the upper echelon sort of, of of that hierarchy kind of thing it like becomes more amplified yeah. than if you're a little guy that's that's why I think on, on set is where you see it the best because there's such an immediate hierarchy you see it yeah. oh, it's, it's in action in front how of you how do you feel about the set hierarchy I fucking love it in terms it. of what like how it's Okay, so let me just preface it and then yeah, say yeah. what I think. Um, what I find interesting about the set hierarchy is that it's a clearly defined hierarchy where you have clearly defined tasks to achieve if you're a PA, yeah. if you're a freaking DOP, if you're, your role is clearly determined. And there's even specifically like, you don't, talk sp- you don't talk to that person, you can talk to that person. The bigger the set, usually yeah. the more defined those hierarchies yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, of course, like, we've all seen the examples where, like, oh, my God, it's so dysfunctional because, like, the one person who made one comment got yelled at for, like, talking out of line. Like, there's ex- excesses, but I kind of like the really clearly defined hierarchies because it allows you to do, like, the highest quality job possible because you're so bored because you can't, like, pay attention to trying to solve that guy's problem, which are so glaring, and you can't say anything. Yeah. That you focus on your problems and you make them, like, you solve everything, right? You're hyper-focused because of that strict hierarchy. I guess I, I like never it. thought about it. I never challenged it really because it's just one of those things that like it is the way it is. Yeah. And it's always been since the beginning. And, and also like when you come up as a film student, you kind of like learn to aspire to the hierarchy of the big sets that you don't yeah. really think about it too much. But true. Is it a perfect system? No. Is it the one absolutely universal not. Perfect? Absolutely not. I think it works. For it might f- be I think it works know. for films. I think it works for because there's so many goddamn creatives in one place that if we didn't have these set limits, like yeah. people would be just talking over each other and trying to like get some sort of power dynamic. Or if, if we say clearly your role is this one, now achieve it to the maximum, it's sick. Like I'm a director and when I'm a, I'm a PA very often on some shoots, dude, I fucking kill the PA job. I love being PA. I'm like, sure, I'm your it, bitch, I'll get you coffee. It, like, I guess it feeds it into <laughs> like basic human behaviors in that like, we're a little like ants in a yeah. little way where if you're give this actually leads into the thing that we were talking yeah, about specialization we were, exactly yeah like I just like well 
know if I want to get into that, but like, yeah. but I, 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 sh I showed you this trailer for something yeah. that we did, yeah. and there were shots in that trailer that, that I got at the, at, the, at the very beginning of the trailer that yeah. were like these really cool It was like cinematic. my favorite shot. Yeah, <laughs> they, they were really sick, but the thing is, I know myself when I'm on a, that was a really, that was a bigger set, and there was like a lot of roles, and so like, yeah. we were talking about how each of us specialized in a role more so than because we come from the same kind of world of like the guerrilla filmmaker, yeah. the the guy to do who has everything or else hats. it doesn't get done. Yeah, like that, that's <laughs> actually a newer thing. That's like a yeah. that's actually a very new thing. That's because the new school of filmmaking. That's yeah. where we're coming from. That's like completely. And it's it's going to be interesting to see what that yields in the future. But yeah. because we come from that, we're used to wearing forty hats. Totally. Uh, I do it all the time. But on that one, we had way less hats. We yeah. were told, "Hey, leave your hats on the table where it's handled." It's it's funny because that example, like in that example, I was in charge of doing interviews and, Which and in the beginning so dope. I, I, I'll show you <laughs> the I had tons of fun with them I know because here's the thing in the beginning I was like I was like again respecting the hierarchy like I like that there is a hierarchy you are assigned a job you do it the best you can um, because or else I would have been like oh well did you guys think about doing that like I would have been trying to contribute to the other stuff and not making my stuff better yeah. so I'm an extreme sports guy right I was like fuck I'm gonna be on the field like there's tons of shooting and stuff and I'm gonna get to dodge bullets and like that sounds like fun, but then um, the people in charge are like, Matt, you're doing the interviews, and at first I'm like, what? Really? Like, that, that was actually my call. <laughs> but I like that call. I know, I Dude, know. I had fun with it, because I was yeah. like, well, I guess they saw that I've been cracking jokes, and they, they like it, and they feel like I can get them like, in the right place, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm yeah. going to crack jokes, I'm going to have fun with them, and then I started fabricating these stories with them, like, not fabricating them, but just like noticing the stories and like making them talk about it, and... I didn't expect to do such a good job at doing interviews. That's not that, my thing, but it I was did, fun. I did think about that because, I, like, I, I know your background, and I know that, like, you could, you would have been super dope on the field, maybe yeah. even more so than the the guys who were there. But I was like, for a lot of reasons, I knew that, like, you were like the perfect dude. And also, also too, like, you had to, you were the one who had to be the most autonomous, independent, yeah, independent, that's true. and you're like. Mr. Independent, like in, in my head, like you can do that. I, I've seen you. I know how many hats you wear in real yeah. life, and I was like, I think you got the edge there for that, and oh, that you got sense. the social behavior kind of thing. Like I, I can't do that. Like that makes sense. I would be able to maybe like a little, not to the degree that you did it, but me personally, it's like a, it's a personality thing. Like I wouldn't be able to because to like make them open up, like kind of thing, or where do you uh, think you wouldn't be able to? I, I don't know what it is. Like I just. Oh, we're under fire. Sorry. Uh, we, there's a lot of uh, guerrilla war here. Holy shit. Uh, Are you, you're used to that. This is either ISIS or construction next door. <laughs> Maybe both, man. Yeah, ISIS That's is now in the construction answer. business. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. It's like a, yeah, it's a personality thing. I'm, I'm less yeah. of the social butterfly and like that's what we needed in that room. Yeah. I think I would have been able to... Not that I'm like, I, I don't talk to anybody or whatever, but it's yeah. just like, in, in the capacity of like, the job that I'm doing in that room, I would have been okay. Mm -hmm. Because they're coming to me kind of thing. Yeah. But I, I know that I could I, I wouldn't have made it as fun for them and all that stuff. And I am super willing to admit that. And that's why mm -hmm. like it took somebody like you. I don't think anybody oh, else cool, would have done that job. And I know you wanted to jump over bunkers and stuff, yeah. <laughs> but like, hey, you know, I, but maybe next time. Here, that's the thing is at the end of the day, because I have a respect for like, to me, when I approach a job, is like the most important thing is the film or the short or the, the web series. Yeah. That is priority number one, two, and three. Who gives a shit about me? No one gives a shit. And it's perfectly fine that way. The idea is to, what can we do to have the best result possible in yeah. this film? I try not to treat the people I work with as like nobody gives a shit about you. I personally have that mentality on my own. I'm perfectly comfortable not having a single person give a shit about me. I'm just a, like just one part of the chain. Yeah. But the priority is the film, and like I was perfectly happy, like and content in my role because I realized, okay, priority is the content, and like let's just find a way to do it to the maximum and have fun with it. Yeah. And is, to me, that's like the hierarchy working, right? But so, what we were saying before that actually though is because it was. A bigger set. There was like a lot of PAs and, yeah. and like a, it was like some six six camera guys yeah. or five or whatever. Yeah. And like because of that, that was what usually when we're when I'm doing like a bigger set that's not the one that we did. Like I'm still wearing a few too many hats than I would like. Yeah. Like I would like to be just DP and I am, but well I I am ADP, but yeah. sometimes I'm a bit more than that. Like sometimes I have to do 
kind of PA work for myself yeah. or for my, my team or whatever. You're uh, also but, probably a camera assistant because a lot of times they don't have like yeah, a camera I just, assistant. I just, just, just did a music video last week. I kind of piggy, piggybacked off yeah. in the studio that we have. Like I, I, I kind of piggybacked off, the, uh, off of a shoot that we had on Friday. Gear stayed over yeah. like Saturday, Sunday, That's so good. I booked one on Sunday. Cool. But I had to do everything, man. And it was like a dolly. Yeah. Yeah. It was like dimming yep. and all that Dude, stuff. Don't tell me about that shit. I do my I music know. videos like 100% independent, like one man team. I, well, I, know, I know you know that. If there's one the, thing the, I'm the proud of, like the stuff I've done is like my music videos. Like I've been featured on some blogs, like the best music videos of the yeah, week yeah, or yeah, some yeah. shit like that. And I look at all the credits from all the other people it's like, and it's these like, huge crews. <laughs> and then it just goes Matt Rich. Yeah. <laughs> that's the generation, man. That's who. That's who. And like, I got, I have that that I know, backbone, and I had to do that. But this one, there was like actually like a ton of stuff. Like there was yeah. a ton of gear, and I had to kind of do it on my own. No, and gaff, so I, that's, that's nothing. Just like dude, no, just man. No, I, I had to show the guys yeah, from the crew. Was it was a, this rap music video. I had to show the guys from the crew how to push the dolly, how to focus it. I had to give <laughs> them marks on the ground, and then I said like, "This is a ball of." I start from scratch. Gangster. Show guys how to dim stuff, whatever. Yeah. But so because that's my usual thing, the problem yeah. with that though is like I can brag about that, but the problem is no matter how good you are, that means that however many roles you have, your attention is divided by that amount of roles. So my yeah. cinematography, like the attention to the finer cinematography yeah. elements, I had to kind of forego that. It's just a law of, totally. of nature or something. And so for this set, the reason why I was able to get kind of creative shots that were not storyboarded like yeah. you asked before is because I had time yeah. and I was like, well, there's a turnaround going on there. The the set, the field where we're shooting is free. Mm -hmm. Hey, somebody jumped in there. I want to do a cool shot. And that's what led to creativity. Totally. So when you're alleviated from responsibilities that you shouldn't maybe have, that'll unlock creativity a little bit. It's, it's crazy because um, like I've been, well, I mean, I find everyone who wants to like achieve a certain level of quality in filmmaking needs to have that realization. Uh, yeah. But I've, I've been like having it, and you need to get to a point where you're specializing and you're really capable of having these bigger productions where you're only doing one job and you're able to do such better work. But like on uh, Uji Zu, my most recent short, yeah. um, I had, like I pretty much had someone for every role. But the thing with me is that I'm so used to wearing every hat that like my supervision of every role was like maybe hard a little, contain. yeah, hard to contain. And also like I love, I love throwing people ideas and like, um, so because of that, I feel like I wasn't like aside looking at the content and thinking and like, so I still kind of divided my energy, but way less than any other of my films. And, and your result, next one after it, you're going to do it way less. Oh, and yeah. one after you can do it way less yeah. to the point where you kind I of get groove. so many lessons on like all my films. But yeah. so on Inu Jezu, like uh, I wanted, in hindsight, I feel like I should have slipped more uh, joke ideas and more like, uh, yeah, like I know direction for the actors to yeah. play it like in a different way. And like, I felt like some of them uh, we were focusing too technically instead of, but again, it was also like, it was, it was a publicity thing, right? It was spoofing like a high end yeah, perfume yeah. commercial. And in the end, like the film did fucking fine. Like uh, we finished. Uh, but it's important to take those, those lessons for me. Oh yeah. Because oh, yeah. other, others might not have but you did, I mean, you edited it, so you probably yeah. noticed that as you're putting the clips together, you're like, oh, fuck, I wish I, but that's, you need to come away, because, you, I mean, your thing went to Fantasia, right? Yeah, that's huge. dude, we got, we got second place, uh, Schwed's Public, oh, best short film. I'm trip. I didn't wow. tell a single soul to vote for me. I was like, there is no chance we're gonna win this. Like, I didn't even who know voted, we were like, in the contest. The, the evening? It or? was uh, people who watch the films, they get to vote. Like, every, anyone who goes to Fantasia, sees a uh, film, uh, and has paid for a ticket, they get to vote for their favorite film. Damn, Dude, congrats, I, I didn't tell, thank you. <laughs> I didn't tell a single person to vote because I didn't know we were in the contest. Uh, and if we were, like I was asked, like, do you get to vote? I'm like, I don't know, I don't care. We don't even have a chance. Why would I? I didn't tell a single person and we got second. So you didn't I was like, for it. Dude, I got, no, not even. I got one guy messaged me like at like midnight. He's like, hey, congrats on your prize, man. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, you didn't know that you won. No. Second place. Oh shit. Okay. <laughs> like what? Second. No, oh, you got a, like an a award. Like, like what are you talking about? No, it's just that it's on their website. Like they uh, they didn't like do anything. They've got their official prizes, which are like jury selected, and then they've got the public prizes. Okay. So, which is like still, I think, a really good honor. Dude, there are hundreds of films there. Like, yeah. It's ridiculous how many films are in Fantasia. Like it's insane. Yeah. So yeah, and so if I would have had more time to say like 
gives the guys more jokes and stuff. Like I feel like it could have been a bit better. But, I feel but you also, always gotta aim for like always be a little better. Right? I, I think it. Yeah, I, that's that's. ISIS back at it. They're stealing cars oh, now. Horn, what? That was a horn. That was a car horn. Uh yeah, probably ISIS just right, stole really the car. Sounded like it came from like... Sounds everywhere. Um, <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Live in the loft. They said it's gonna be fun. They said. <laughs> um. Uh, uh, what was I gonna say? We're talking oh, yeah, about yeah. yeah. Uh, so like about like the stuff that you wish you did. Like so obviously like you're gonna take your lessons from this one yeah. into the next one so for sure you're gonna like kind of I guess you call it micromanaging I guess is what you're doing what like, do you mean like, well, uh, like in less, terms of like not being the lesson is that I'm gonna micromanage less is that yeah, what you're saying yeah exactly yeah so like but the thing is another thing that can happen too though is and this is something that like I, I, I'm getting to know more and more is that like also sometimes you gotta go through a process of working with different crews so that you get to the one yeah. that actually caters to the way yeah. you do things as well. You know, so you guys all cater to how you do things. It's like a, like a hockey team. You gotta, yeah, totally. I, I've like me. The thing is, I I say it all the time. Like the important roles on a set. Like I'm literally looking to fall in love with different people yeah. on the sets. Like to me, the DOP relationship needs to be fucking yeah. tight. Because they're, I mean, we're working together like so much, right? We need to get along. We need to have the same sort of artistic vision, the same sort of process. We need to communicate in a language that's effective. Um, so, to me, that's super important. And same thing, first AD. I have such a hard time finding a good uh, first AD. Like, there's, I've worked with a couple that yeah. I like, but that dynamic is also super important. And it's yeah. hard because, I mean, it's kind of their job to be the bitch, but like, what's like to be up? really like mean and like yeah. quick and like get shit rolling, right? Well, they don't need to be mean, but like it's their job. No, to but be I know rough, what you mean. That's like a connotation. You know? Of course. But what the funny thing is, like, I guess on on a film set because we're like is is kind of like you got a four because you know like the best actual like you know really like 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 loving relationships yeah. are also kind of founded on the same precepts you know you gotta get along to the same degree as you gotta get along through dp yeah because also another big thing is like you, it's like a give and take thing right exactly. so like the thing that you exactly. gotta learn with your dp that you choose to function the best is like you gotta know like okay i got i'm gonna give him this but i'm gonna take this for myself exactly and it's the same it's in give and take it's compromise you yeah. gotta be able to say something and hold your point when it's really important but also listen and be like wow that's really interesting and like to me like i need to be in love like with the person i work with like i'm, I'm in love with like their work right yeah and yeah. um and the dynamic that we have like it, it's a fucking relationship like you spend so much time on set with and i mean like dude i love you dude like i like working with you like in that sense like it doesn't like it's not a actual like guy and girl no, love no, no, thing no, no, it's no. what i mean is it's the same sort of dynamic and same sort of relationship where we're gonna be arguing we're gonna be yeah. debating points and we need to listen and we need to compromise and we need to like pay attention to the other person like Ooh, he looks a little pissed right now. Why the fuck is he pissed right now? Because or else you're not gonna give me good work, and yeah. like it's it's not gonna go well. Like I don't know. I think it's a really interesting. I, I, I think it's a good it's parallel really between. It, it's a good parallel between like a romantic relationship because yeah. in both cases emotions are involved, yeah. and like you need to be oh, yeah. super aware. Like okay, like okay, so the guy's pissed. What do you do? Like do you do you come in? Do you let him vent yeah. off? Is he gonna vent? Off? Like it's like it comes from knowing somebody. Yeah. And also like so I remember on one of them too, like uh, on uh, on the one that we did uh, unlocked. Yeah. I remember at one point we were doing I think it was the dinner scene mm -hmm. uh, between. Yeah, that one was uh, hard. But I remember at one point you actually just grabbed the camera and operated. Yeah. And the thing I is like I do that. <laughs> yeah, but I thought about it because the thing is like I was like I didn't fight it at all and I was like yeah. dude take it man like that I'd, I'd much I rather I love that about working with yeah, you too but I'd much rather actually DP from the monitor yeah because that's again I'm you can unburdened. observe more things yeah. yeah and also I think like I'm very very kind of voodooistic with the actual camera yeah. operation because I think that like what do you mean by that well, yeah, I think I think I kind of understand. But, I kind but of the, know this is actually going to lead me into mother, actually. Yeah. Because cool. the, so the camera operating is, I think for on a lot of sets that I've been on, it is kind of like when it's a handheld shot. I mean, but even when it's not, I think for every was, scenario, yeah, for everything. I, I think we get along, but I want to hear what you're yeah, saying because yeah. so, so, I don't so, want to influence it. No, <laughs> for 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 handheld, yeah. which is what we did, yeah. and I think. The thing is, like, people don't understand this, but and I actually have the perfect example of something that I did. But um, 
So I think that the whoever you give it to, especially when it's handheld, yeah. has that person's fingerprints on every image so, and personality. Dude, totally. Um, I one of my sayings that I, I say all the time, and I'm still trying to find my DOP, which I'm in love with his frame. Yeah. I love your framing. I find your framing is always spot on. Yeah. Uh, it's your camera holding, which I I don't think I'm I'm starting to like think about it, and I think maybe I won't find the DOP who's like. Framing, I don't always because agree with. You've got because you got to direct that like an actor. Well, that's what I, that's my saying. Yeah. Is that you know what? There's two actors in the scene. No, there's three because the camera there, the way that he responds, it's, it's that everything. that tension, like she just said something tense, like yeah. or or like she, it's soft and like inquisitive, like what is she saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The the camera's a fucking. It's a person. It's it's gotta yeah. act in a certain way. And I think when it's on a tripod, it's it's symbolizing tension. It, when it's on a, a glide cam or, or a Movi or whatever the, the gyro stabilizers or whatever, every, what we're always using now for everything, yeah. which I think is the dumbest thing in the world, that also symbolizes Man, that's, something. That, that goes to my point that I'm gonna kind yeah. of reinforce. Let's that. keep it, I think, for after uh, the the movie talk because I yeah. want to get into Mother, but um, dude, we can keep talking yeah, for a long true, time. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think let's go watch this movie, uh, yeah. which I have concussions and the worst memory. The movie is the Thin Red Line. It's a 1998 film uh, by Terrence Malick. And uh, so it's a bit of a, I think it's like a war thing. Yeah. So We need those. Yeah. We need that one. Exactly. <laughs> Let's get her done. Let's get it. <laughs> We're back. Getting red line. How good was that movie, though? It was dope. I'm, I'm a, yeah. I got like it's like a funny thing with like me and Terrence Malick because mm. he's like because he's more prolific now these days yeah and uh, yeah he can get really pretentious with his shots like he can get really carried away especially in his late I'm not talking about Thin Red Line yeah but you see elements of that where he's like very much interested in like the B roll just as much as like the yeah. main stuff yeah I find that so, very it's true I find it very interesting that a director would put so much effort and attention into the B roll like type of stuff like waiting for the cloud That's, yeah and yeah. getting the right timing like i was like Shh. there's, a, there's no a, way that those clouds were random like no because because yeah. light was just such a, a constant pattern across like the light light was used as like a, now i'm forgetting the term but when you're constantly bringing some a motif, motif across yeah. the whole film and there was a lot of symbolism through the light right and yeah no the, the, i clouds. don't like i mean we know with filmmaking like there's no way that that was no not planned like there because like and he also has a reputation for being a guy who will like kind of stare up at the sky and if it's not looking like he wants it to yeah. look today for those scenes they're going to change it or just not shoot at all yeah that's the the shooting of this thing took was like insane apparently it was like uh it just over like months and months and uh he's yeah in his later films when you, especially if you look at tree of life and from that point on because at, at, at around tree of life that he started making one every year mm. or one every two years but before he would make, uh, like I was just telling you, Thin Red Line was like his first one since I think Heaven's Gate, which was like in the late 70s. This one was 1998. Yeah, 98, yeah. So then 20, 21 years, something like that. So yeah, like, and then after after Tree of Life, he, he's still making one a year. It's just like, you don't hear about them because like a lot of them just goes like, you know, it's limited theatrical release or straight to DVD. Mm. And, but they're like with huge names, like Christian Bale and stuff. And I think it's just because he built up his notoriety and... If, well, I, I don't know. They're, they're just, like, a lot of them just, they're, get, they get carried away in just kind of, like, visual poetry instead mm -hmm. of substance. And yeah. Like, they kind of, like, Story. Tree of Life was his, like, big kind of re-return since I think, like, the a new uh, the, the new world, which mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't seen, but it was it's a, kind of like a Pocahontas-type story with Christian Bale and stuff. And then he made Tree of Life, and then that one was super, you know, the way it was, and it was like really, it was as celebrated when it came out. Yeah. But all of his films after that have looked and felt just like um, Tree of Life. And I remember hearing when Tree of Life came back. That's came out, like he found his style, and he just like went all in on his style. And I don't know, yeah, kept that it, right? kind of liquid narrative style. Like his he, film was very, very, very liquid. Like, yeah. I feel like there was traces of that in there because like. You flow from one character to another, from one scene to another. Yeah, that's doing the crossfades really cool. and like, yeah, it's very like um, there's it's it's sort of it's linear but also non-linear in who you follow. You're well, like, oh, now we're following this guy. Now we're following that guy. Yeah. Like 
very unusual way to do filmmaking. It's, which it's I think like, is awesome. and, and it's cool. Like, it's not the first movie that I've seen do that. Like, the I mean, you haven't seen it yet, but Goodfellas, yeah. which yeah, I hope you get to in the next oh, yeah. couple of weeks because you're going to love that movie. Oh, you but saw that, that one on my list there. That's yeah. why you're saying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, you're going to have such a good yeah. time watching that. But that one, there's uh, multiple narrators and it comes out of nowhere. Like, boom, now it's the girl narrating. That's cool. And it's, and it's like, he had just been, like, the main character, Ray Liotta, had just been narrating and then boom, she comes in and she, it's her perspective on like things. That. But he, Scorsese, makes it a stylist thing yeah whereas this one it was very kind of seamless it was just now it's the general it was never in your face it was just like it just flowed from one to another it wasn't like uh yeah it wasn't like a heavy stylistic decision no one thing that i found interesting about the characters and the flowing from one character to another uh now thinking about the film a little bit i feel like what was interesting was so he had the intellectual character who's just analyzing the war from his intellectual perspective he had the religious character who was analyzing the war from a religious perspective. He had the romantic, who sort of, you know, romanticized everything with yeah. his girlfriend or his wife. Cheating bitch. Uh, <laughs> spoiler alert, you're supposed to say that before, but sorry. Just write it in there. Yeah. And, um, and, the, and then they also had the, the angry, more primal, uh, like, kind of company guy. Like, company guy. Yeah. Um, I find it interested how, interesting how he flowed from one character to another who basically looked at the war through different perspectives. Yeah, and I find what was masterful of him is that, and you get that like deep narration from each different character, I find what was a very strong, um, it's a very difficult thing to be able to explore a concept as loaded as war through different lenses like intellectual, religious, yeah. like yeah. as a director, you know, in terms of like for these characters, like it's interesting, it's a great tool that these characters are covering it from many perspectives, but as a director, like, damn dude, nice job <laughs> being yeah. able to understand your subject from so many levels and capturing it in such a poetic way, like, shit. That's it. <laughs> that was impressive. I, and I agree 100% with that, because it's, uh, yeah, you don't get too many uh, films of the same company of people yeah. with that amount of different, because I've seen movies that jump from like allegiances, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like Clint Eastwood did one, uh, no, he did two movies, Flags of Our Fathers and then Letters from Iwo Jima where he goes, the American side was Flags of Our Fathers and then it's the same exact conflict just from the other side oh, that's cool. and it's the, Je the, Je the Japanese. Yeah. But uh, that one is like within the same outfit, it's jumping perspective and because the same outfit is doing the same thing, it's just mm. seen through five different yeah. lenses. That's, but yeah. if, I, if I can play slightly because I really like the movie yeah. but just slightly play devil's advocate there's one thing that we were talking about what, during the movie is and I'm gonna, I want to ask you about this did you at any point find it difficult to watch uh, yes because um, especially the beginning because it's this sort of because it's sort of flows story wise into different things you, you never get enough information in the beginning to get hooked which okay. is a difficult thing. That, that wasn't actually my question. Though. Wait, on what level then? Uh, on the level of the... Like how harsh it was? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I mean. Um, yes. I find, like, it was more of a, an emotional hardness. It wasn't like, oh my god, look at this gore and, like, look at this, like, just really tense you up because you're yeah, just, yeah. like, way too into the action. And you're like, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. Like, I didn't feel that too much, but... I'm, pretty hardened I think maybe because stuff but yeah I think um, we all are but I think it was more of an emotional hardness which was really cool okay yeah that 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 okay because I think that one of the two or actually maybe both are super important in war films I think because I'll say yeah I'll, I'll, I can tell you like my favorite one of all time I think let me guess it saving prior <laughs> how <laughs> how could it be it's not like we talked about this while watching the film times <laughs> No, uh, it's it is man, and, but it's yeah, not my no. favorite in that like I'll put it Solid in every tech. Sunday afternoon, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. just like it's just honestly my favorite films are films I cannot watch again. Yeah, I have about three films. I'm like I don't think people get that amazing, but never again. It well, it's like never again. Like I talk, I talk to you. I'm not gonna yeah. watch that every. It's too heavy. Aronofsky, no, this is Black Every Swan. Black Swan's makes. not my favorite, but um, yeah, absolutely everything Aronofsky yeah, makes. You can't just rewatch it again no. the next day. You don't want to. Uh, no. Requiem for a dream. Yeah, I, I rewatch that film every ten years, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is why I don't watch yeah. this film anymore. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, it's like a giant steak dinner. You know, like you yeah. can't, you're not gonna do that too because it's just too hard to digest and break exactly. down. You're, you gotta space that shit out. Exactly. Like Aronofsky does that. Aronofsky and, uh, is 
to me the master of that. He's yeah. just, his films are hard. Uh, Tarantino, um, recent, not all of Tarantino's well, he's films more are hard to rewatch. Because you could, you could jump, they're fun. Um, Django, though, is not one of those rewatchable no, films I found. That's true, I, I recently rewatched it. And that. it was, I found it slow rewatching it. I found it was slow and the brutal parts, like the parts with the dogs, and like there's a lot of brutal yeah, shit, yeah. and you're like, oof, I don't know if I can stomach that again. Yeah. Um, but it's also got but a slowness to it effective. because. Absolutely. And the thing about Tarantino, though, is that um, you're discovering his universe every time you watch his films because he redoes, like, his film language changes, like, on kind of like on every film. Like, some of his film, he'll just for some reason do, like, I'm just whipping random ideas out. Like, for example, like, he'll do crossfades a lot in one film, and then the other one, he'll do, like, this special weird narration or he just changes his style like a lot in every different film yeah, so you're yeah. discovering his style on his film even though it's still everything is very Tarantino you're discovering the universe yeah. and like that makes it very watchable at first but when you rewatch it it's like it doesn't have that magic that it had I find the first time oh yeah that's what I find about Tarantino that's but I, I still like he's one of my favorite directors like by far yeah I just find his films hard to rewatch except like a couple of them like uh, Kill Bill for example is just like it's just Awful. pure fun like yeah. it's just ridiculously yeah, over yeah. the top and, but like, that's that, well, actually that's a really good example because so, like if I compare and it's not comparable because the yeah. Saving Private Ryan is like a war film but yeah. the treatment this is something that I've always been a fan of uh, uh, of Spielberg's for, which is yeah. in his movies that are the hard hitting movies in which there's a lot of violence. He does violence, I think, unlike anyone, because he makes it super clumsy, mm. which is how yeah. it would be. Like yeah, yeah, Munich, yeah. did you see Munich? I don't think I have. The, it's just about like a, it's like a bunch of it's a, a bunch of like Mossad Jews who go after the uh, the guys who were responsible for uh, les attentats the. Uh, Hijackers? The, no, no, the, like uh, so in the 1976 Munich Olympics, yeah. there were a bunch of uh, of um, extremists, Muslim yeah. extremists, who broke into the Olympic Village and went into the Jewish athletes' uh, <laughs> barracks and and uh, and held them there. Classic. And then there was like a big slaughter, and everyone ended up dying. And but it was. How like, do I not news. know about this? This is the type of yeah, shit. It's crazy. I love and there was a standstill. There was a standstill, like a, yeah. like a sort of a standstill on the uh, in the Olympic Village. The, all the guys were in one building, and like it was just like police and news helicopters. And all the around. film is about that. Well, the film is about the aftermath of that. So the film is about. Um, so the the prime minister at the time uh, of Israel was this uh, the, this this woman. Uh, what the hell is her name? Oh, woman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, I forget her name, but uh, I'm pretending I'm she's got like a very famous like historical name. But uh, anyways, like it was about her response, like her under the table response. She goes, "Okay, we can't officially do yeah. anything," but she hired a bunch of Mossad guys to go undercover and to uh, eliminate them one by one. Everyone, all the architects of it, mm. and the the punch of it is like you know you kill one guy, there's a worse guy who comes right after. What's the point of what we did, you know? But the whole movie is about the guys, the Mossad guys, and their their offing of the dudes who were responsible, mm. and they go and crazy. It was clumsy. The, and it was clumsy way. because the, so their first kill, I remember, like they shoot the guy wrong, and he's mm. not quite dead, and he's like still advancing, and the just the way that he does it, and and also the hijacking too. Like there's just dudes who get shot in the cheek, and it's just. But they're not dead. Yeah. And they're still standing, and like just even the the uh, executions are super dirty. But it makes it so real because it's not yeah. really stylized at all. Mm -hmm. And Saving Private Ryan is really like that. Like so, they reenact reenacted the D Day invasion. I love how uh, it took you so long to get to tying it together, but you did it masterfully. Hey, <laughs> and then I'm gonna tie back to that. I'm impressed. Go all. Oh. <laughs> I might get an erection here. The levels here. of intricacy. Good is thing just... this table is hiding my erection. <laughs> Go um, on, sir. So, <laughs> but now is where I might be lost. Well, I told uh, you. Yeah, no, the, the the invasion. So, like, Spielberg apparently did that. The invasion, He the way he filmed it, it was chronological. So he had, he sent dudes with cameras on the shoulder, just like wartime so photographers. They, they fucked with the shutter angle and made it all kind of jerky. Okay. They shot at like a 90 degree shutter angle to make the, 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 the action look super choppy yeah, yeah, yeah. and immediate. And uh, the way that I dudes like are that. like kind of, you know, their like limbs are getting blown off and stuff, but it's, it's so realistic because mm. they never make a point of showing it. It happens, but you're following okay. Tom Hanks kind of thing. Yeah. So and he never like places, uh, now we insert the blood. Now no, we insert no, so that yeah. we can contrast with this. It's and, just like, happening. It just, it happens. And it, oh, it happens yeah. to be there. Oh my God. And it's just one of those sequences like where like the, the lens is dirty, the yeah. fucking cameras are filthy and it's because they put but the operators right there. Did they shoot it as a sort of, not mockument, not 
mockumentary, but they shoot it as like a semi-documentary style, like where the cameras were justified and explained to be there in the film, or were no, they? No, no, they no, were no, actual no. cameras that you're not supposed to pay no, attention no, no, to. No, no, like you're kind of like like diegetic, non-diegetic cameras kind yeah. of thing. Like yeah, no, it, it, it's it's cool. it's not like brought it's like those style guys choice. out there with them, and it's just so well done, and you're rooted to the perspective of the guys advancing the line so you never jump ahead kind of living it yeah as like one of them from time to time you'll get like a shot from because the way that the the way it was is like you had the beach and then you just had the german bunkers there and they were just mowing dudes mm -hmm. down just yelling these mowing these young men down just oh we're talking about uh seven prep yeah. right now yeah oh now i know exactly what you're talking about yeah absolutely what did you think of that one? uh i thought we were still on the other movie uh the the the, the olympics thing Oh no 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 yeah. no no! But okay. that's, it's still Spielberg. One hundred percent, and yeah. I know exactly what you're saying about Private Ryan, and now I can visualize what yeah. you're saying, and but yeah, the, that's like, like one of the most visceral parts of it. Yeah. Oh, you see it? Yeah, you're. Okay, you yeah, are yeah. basically the cameraman, yeah. and you are scared for your life. You're yeah. seeing a bunch of fucked up shit, and you don't have time to stay there and look at this fucked up shit because you got to move on and like. Yeah, and also like the so dudes who landed it's on the so beach. Powerful. They had like these bunkers that had been placed, but they had to fucking move because there were more ships coming and they yeah. had to make way for the new guys to come there. And there's just so many. Um, I saw that uh, movie when I was a kid, which I shouldn't have, but I did <laughs> somehow. I don't remember when I first saw it, but I remember it being strikingly Damn. fucking intense Dude, because it's, it's 45. It's probably it's like 40. still today one of the most intense yeah. scenes ever shot. And it's done. I just watched it again with my girlfriend, and <laughs> at the end of the 40 minute opener, she was like, Jesus fucking Christ. And I was like, by the way, the movie's minutes? starting now. It's like 30, 40 minutes, something like that. The ball's on Spielberg, yeah. huh? But it's like, there's no other way to do that because, mm. like, that that D-Day invasion is such an it's iconic feel. moment in history, and you can't do it... What better way to make you feel it and live it than to actually give the tension to the camera, give the seeing your friends dying without the cuts, and, like, yeah. you're really fucking, like... You are the person. What yeah. a better, what better way to make the audience live the intensity and the every goddamn emotion that's there than just recreate it and give like they make did. the camera a person. But also, and, but also, so to like stay thematic, the violence in there, like yeah. Spielberg has, like has some of the moments of violence that I, that are just burned in my memory from Schindler's List yeah. to, to Saving Private Ryan that I'll never forget. Yeah. There, like the, the bit with the guy holding his arm, like he, he, he's looking for his arm in the, in the mud, in, in, the, uh, in the turf, he finds it and just starts walking off with it. There's so many moments oh like the guy, god. the guy slowly, uh, oh, that was your monitor. It's a monitor that died. Speaking uh, of death, oh my god, things are dying everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many moments in, in Schindler's List that I'll, that I'll remember because of the gore, but the thing is, what yeah. that does is it's never gratuitous and it makes you fear every gunshot. Exactly. And you, you have to. And so exactly. in this film, like, to me it was, because you know, like, you have these beautiful sweeping oh, yeah. steady cam shots and you yeah. don't have these jib shots. Again, and, motifs the whole way through. Yeah, and yeah. like, to me it's like, you're like beautifying it and I always kind of you, find that weird. You felt that you, they beautified the violence? Not necessarily the violence per se. Okay, the fact that the choices of the camera movement and stuff were like too beautiful for some of the really intense parts? Kind of. Because they were on glide instead of being on real like... Yeah, fight. yeah. Okay. But I don't know, like it, it's, it's probably... Mm, I shouldn't be holding, you know, every work to that standard, but I'm just saying, like yeah. when I saw it, the violence of it and the deaths were kind of weightless. I find... In this film, they yeah. were weightless. I no, find, not, I find all, it really, not all of them. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. In the in the in the core of the action, I completely agree with you. Yeah. So when when like that's, uh, that's right, when shit ever. was hitting the fan, you're right that the the violence was so gratuitous. Um, but here's the thing, that's what makes it so good because in the time where war really shit hits the fan. You don't have time for emotions. You're, it's gratuitous killing. You're just running through there and just like, fuck! I need to yeah. see. Like, I find like because there was like there was that, but there was also the contrasting side of it where the time where you know the guy ended up making a mistake and killing himself. They took the time with that death and made yeah. it like yeah, that's, ugly. That's, that's, and, so that's not one of them that I would count in that yeah. category. Well, that was well, what a Spielberg esque. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, very much. But what I think is that. There's the two sides of it. So what I think this guy was going for was covering like sort of all aspects of war, like in terms of yeah, yeah. like yeah. he covered a lot of the aspects and a lot of the different angles. But um, 
there is that part of the killing which is gratuitous. You don't give a fuck if this guy's name is Jean Guy and he has a yeah. Cousin no, I know. Or, I like, know that they're you're just you're just trying to survive and you're just like fuck, like murdering everywhere, right? So but, I feel like I those think, scenes capture that because that's what it's yeah, supposed to be. In Spielberg, in, in Second Private Ryan, there is a number of like quote unquote tr- not gr- gratuitous is the wrong word because it yeah. just it means violence for no reason you know yeah, yeah. but I, I just mean like weightless de- you, don't, you don't have to feel the weight of every yeah, single yeah. death because there's a, like a thousand people who die in Saving Private Ryan but it's the it's the technical things I think that I'm talking about like yeah. the film like there's something about the sound design in the Spielberg thing the gunshots are just fucking yeah. roars yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the bullets just missing there's something about the visceralness of every death and the gore in Saving Private Ryan and, and a lot in mm. all Spielberg films that just gets me at like a more yeah. of a gut level than yeah. in this one, because in this one also like I've I've seen a lot of films with like those like a lot of the deaths that I saw I can't really explain it but like sometimes you have a guy running and then there's like a destination <gasps> that goes yeah like that, that yeah, kind yeah, of thing I don't know how to describe that but I'm just like I know that's a stunt guy it's, you know like, <laughs> of course um, but have you seen any of the real like World War Two footage of people getting shot no it's comical <laughs> it's awful to say. But Where a lot of times, there, there's a lot of, uh, a lot, uh, there's a fair amount of World War II footage, because they, in World War II, they had to send home footage, like, to, yeah, 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 to the country sure. to keep people motivated and all that stuff, and uh, there's some filmmakers that went on the front lines, and you can find it on YouTube and stuff, like, because it's historical, yeah. but you see the guys just running, and then just like, ah, and then falling, it's crazy. I'm it's, sure, I'm it's sure that is, but I guess just as it translates to the screen in a film, yeah. That's but it's a minor gripe though what I'm saying of because course, of I, course. I I really really I, I'm I'm like a fan of Terrence Malick's style yeah and I like the juxtapositions that we talked about during the film you yeah. know like uh, just a lot of the stuff but it's just because I feel like I was um, sort of I've seen Saving Brian Ryan I've yeah, seen yeah, better of treatments of, of it that like and, I mean he's at the level where we're comparing you to Spielberg so oh man nice definitely. job buddy like, oh yeah <laughs> it's yeah, like. Yeah. Right? He yeah, definitely is there. Of course, like, I think every film you should... I think every film you should criticize, like, even, like, the Masters, because if you can find oh, criticism yeah. in what the Masters do, then there's a lot of wealth to that information, because it's, like, that that's an important piece that they didn't find, and if you find it... Or they, they, most of the times what I think happens is people find the things that they want to solve, and they just, because of, you know, budgetary limitations, time limitations, like... Yeah. Films are a hard thing to make, and like a lot of these I mistakes. Especially one of that, of that scope, man. Like that's that's something. I mean, there were some shots in there. Like I remember, t- like there, like look at that long shot. Just there's like a hundred and fifty people that's running, yeah, a plane yeah. going, the time of the clouds, like that shot, the setup time and on there, that shot must there have been were, like four or five hours. There were crazy. still, there were still. They probably had like a bunch of cameras running though, man. Like, yeah, I don't think he's like one of those single single camera type dudes, like no, Christopher no, Nolan. Yeah. But because uh, mm-hmm. also when you have that many people, man, you better be running units, you know. Yeah, but that makes um, sense. Th- there was there Kept were a couple running of like units. Now I'm saying <laughs> there there were a couple of uh, of like really good things uh, in the battle sequences though that we, we talked about, which was like uh, there's like at one point there's a battle for the first hill. Yeah, that and one's good. there re- you're really rooted for for most of the film you're rooted to the Americans pushing the thin red line. I love how they yeah I love how they delayed getting the other perspective. Yeah, that's what. It, yeah, I don't know. I actually, I maybe have to see it again. But I don't know what the jumping off point was. It was pretty much there. They, there was one shot when they were about to go to the mountain, to, to the that base, where they showed like empty bullet shells on a yeah. rock, which yeah, yeah, we yeah. understood was the the point they were going in, and it was this eerie Dolly forward once mm-hmm. again, which is like a thematic thing that he yeah. established. Uh, and then they go there and boom, 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 bombard everything, and there's nothing there finally. And then we, for the first time, start to see a bunch of Japanese emerging towards yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And then later in that scene, we finally see like the gunmen, like from their side, like the Japanese going like, okay. fuck. Yeah. And then later on, but what's cool is that like, you discover. I found that was very masterful because you discover sympathy for the Japanese in the same order that these soldiers discover sympathy for the Japanese, right? Yeah. yeah so in I the be- part, yeah. I find that just like so goddamn powerful. Because in the beginning, you, you don't see them. They're just this mysterious force on the other side of the grass that shoots at you and that murders you. And you're like, oh my god, what the fuck is this? And then you discover them. And you're like, faces. Oh my god, these people have faces. And you're shooting yeah. them. And then you, yeah. you end up going on in their camp. And they're crying together. 
and they're like they're really as tense and as like dramatic as all these guys are and they're like Whoa, we're kind of the same I find that was just like um, I find that was very 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 powerful well, I, th choice. I think well, an another thing that was point that was poignant in around that time that you're talking about was the shame of being captured that yeah. you, you actually pointed out that scene yeah like they're just like kind of just beating themselves up well, literally killing themselves about it. There's yeah. a guy who like, fucking kills himself because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like a, the shame of being captured and not dying for his country. Jesus, oh, man. man. That That's was a really fucked well up. Done. That's a fucked up thing about war. And like, I, I like, I like reading about, well, I like reading about things that scare me. Like, I tend to just, I've been super curious about oh, war and like, just because I want to understand the thing so that I can, uh, to me, like, I, I get less scared of things I understand. So that's kind of like my process. And that's like influencing what I'm doing in terms of film. Like, I'm researching a bunch of stuff because I want to be less scared of it. And there are so many stories about, like, war that are just like, oh, shit, shit is terrifying. Like, I, yeah. War is a nasty prospect. The, one, I think one of the, I mean, I hate to keep referring to it, but one of the best little tiny sequences of what you're talking about, like, war, how scary yeah. war must be, and that moment when you're about to get to the front line and mm -hmm. engage in it for the first time is... Saving Private Ryan, yeah. the opening five, the five, like after the, there's like a cemetery sequence where like this old guy walks up to like a grave and you don't quite know who it is and then it frost dissolves yeah, yeah. to the boats, then they're yeah. approaching the, the beach and there's like a two or three minute sequence where, you know, they, they kind of rolled up with those boats that like, you know, like the, the, yeah. the door falls. U-boats. U-boats, yeah, exactly. And uh, okay. and then you just hear bullets bouncing off, you hear explosions and then you just see I think there's like one bullet first, right? Like, phew! And yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then just shit hits the fan. Yeah, it, it hit, but like oh. so, it, it, and then in that sequence when you're in the U boats, you get just singles on yeah. all these kids, and they're just like, you know, eyes wide, and there's some of them in the background are throwing up, yeah. and they're like, "Fuck, That's man!" Such a powerful. And scene. then the door drops, and yeah. then you're like, "Oh shit!" And then they all just you have, die oh, man, for no yeah. goddamn reason. <laughs> that was that was an amazing sequence yeah. of like, you know, you're you're about to go. Like I've never been more transported in a moment than for, in a war film than that right oh, there. Yeah. Of course, you're sucked into it because here, what I what I think works well with Saving Private Ryan is that like, so the the mystery I find like films start well when they start with a certain mystery and when the payoff is delivered in the right time. So if the the mystery is too long, like I find with this film, my my problem with the film, if I have one, uh, was that the mystery in the beginning I wanted answers and it lasted a bit too long before we had answers, right? Yeah, uh, I didn't get sucked into the story very fast. So why that is? So and and basically, I find what works so well about this uh, Saving Private Ryan is that the mystery is like you're in the boat with these guys, like you're just hearing the sounds, you're not a hundred percent sure where they're, now you are because like you can't look at Saving Private Ryan without yeah. knowing what it is anymore, um, but it builds this mystery of like okay what's about to happen and then the payoff is immediate and, but even larger than that too is the very beginning of the film you just see this old guy and he's yeah, in that's Washington the mystery. And, exactly. he's and then that literally the pays off at the very end because you don't know you know that because it doesn't tell you which of the characters this old yeah. guy is looking down at, at a grave so you go well who survives you mm. know and it could be any one of them because they're all around the same age that's solid so that's that, great that even makes you wonder who will survive that's, it. that's like at the a very tool end, that, uh, that at the very very end you. you have a close up of the guy who survives and then it dissolves to the older guy that you saw at the very beginning and you're like ah oh, shit that's solid yeah that's, that's it solid. Um, but actually you know what, what's funny is my, my theory on on the on your problems your issues with the beginning yeah. is because I agree with you with like you can't hang on to that mystery too long because then yeah. people are just dislocated. They eventually give up on it. They're like, well, exactly. okay, I'll get answers eventually, disinterest until I get information. Yeah. yeah. I think the reason why is because they made it up as they went along in the edit. Because this is what I heard yeah, I feel about like the main yeah, character. Yeah, I feel like they did. Yeah. Because, like well, I mean, they literally did because yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they didn't know who the fuck their main character was until <laughs> they were editing. But then I think when they did change it, they had shot it a certain way and now you're kind of like, you know the what's the term? Like, the film yeah, language yeah. is not made for this new narrative. That's it. You're exactly. reinventing. That's, okay. it, it wasn't That's set it. up. I was probably. gonna say some other fucking metaphor. Like, <laughs> Aller contre le poil or whatever. Like flatter contre la boîte. Is, is that a, is that? Oh, is yeah. it with flatter contre la boîte? <laughs> you gotta say it like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like that. So like from that point on, when they decided, like, oh, you know, we're gonna make the main character this dude yeah. and not Cater the dude Gold. who shows up at the red carpet thinking he's <laughs> yeah. the main actor. That's. Oh my I got, I feel God. like I gotta I gotta Please say that tell again. Him. 
Whoa. So, like, the movie stars a number of people who aren't uh, Adrian Brody. <laughs> and, and the reason why is because, like, so, I mean, he was in the script, whatever script there was going around, yeah. he was the main character, Adrian Brody, who plays a um, guy who doesn't talk three or four or whatever yeah. in that movie. And uh, he was the main character, so I think they largely shot around him, and he was in scenes, dramatic scenes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then um, he wrapped the film, and then for probably a year or two thought, oh, I'm going to be on the star of this big film, and he shows up to the red uh, carpet. This, big fil- this film with all the this biggest stars, man. and yeah. I'm the star. Exactly. And so he <laughs> oh shows up God. to the red carpet, um, and is just like looking like a million bucks, probably doing a couple of interviews, and when he sits down and watches the thing, he's... In I mean, how many lines is he? Have? I don't even think he has one line. Does he even speak? He probably grunts once or to, twice. To me, they're all like standard issue military men, so I, yeah. I'm very bad at recognizing faces. So well, no, he's, the, he's the, the guy who, like, at the very end, like when they're like the three of them go out to like yeah, scout. Yeah, yeah. He's like one of them. He's the guy who like survives. He's very unimportant and unnoticeable. Like, he was the main character, man. <laughs> like the <laughs> amount of the that? amount of shit that was on the cutting room floor, where he's like in dramatic scenes, acting probably amazingly. <laughs> And then he's just like, this is my breakthrough, man. This is my fucking breakthrough. Did this guy end up having a career? He did, but like, Whew, yeah. Thank God, yeah. happy endings. He did. He, he has an okay career. I don't think as, as yeah, good yeah, as yeah. if he had starred in a Terrence, 1998 <laughs> Terrence Malick film. But he, uh, he was later, three years later, he was in this big film, The Pianist. And it was a World War II film. And I'm a big fan of Pianist. <laughs> He was um, he he won the Oscar for best actor for that film. So he okay. was he's, he was good. But like okay. imagine and apparently Mickey Rourke was in it. Um, he had a really he got cut. He actually had a really good. I remember hearing him talking about this. He had a really deep, meaty like dramatic scene that he was like looking for, and it just it wasn't even. He's not oh. even in the film once. Not even his face. Here's the, and I've told you this before. The ruthlessness on this director. I kind of respect. Yeah, that's... But is but the way of doing it, you tell your producer, look, I gotta cut this guy, can you tell this guy he's been cut for reasons, you deal with it. How do you in not his tell defense, the guy? In his defense, there was no texting back then. <laughs> I feel like that's can, a text... Yeah, him. I feel like that's a text conversation. By the way, you're, not in it. you're cut. <laughs> <laughs> Amount of scenes you're in, zero. <laughs> Tomorrow, don't show up. Oh man, you'll, that's a you'll, tough. you'll learn why. <laughs> <laughs> that's bad, man. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, but but that's his thing. That's his thing. Like he had he did a his I think next movie after that was The New World, and in that one, the reason I know this is because I watched this interview with Christopher Plummer, our grand Canadian okay. actor Christopher Plummer. Oh, and yeah. He um, he said that uh, he was in The New World, and he is in the film, but that Malik basically cut him out as well. And uh, he said that this dude just, he needs a fucking writer. He needs someone who sits him down and goes, listen, don't shoot B-roll all the time. <laughs> and he, Plummer himself said, like, you know, we'll be there. We'll be, like, getting ready for a scene. And he's over there with the DP shooting a fucking tree trunk. I wonder if he's got a B-crew for B-roll. No, it's him. I feel like I'm he sure should. sure it's him. <laughs> well, like you see how directed B-crew the B-roll is? B-roll. You see how directed that is? Yeah. Very much so. That's him, man. <laughs> it's crazy. That's him. I find that it's like I have respect for that. The same way I respect like Edgar Wright's extreme zoom ins. They're the oh, stupidest thing to do, and you're the only one doing them. Baby Driver. Killing it. Oh, I love Baby Driver. Yeah, man. Oh my god. That's a dope. Thing. I uh, watched Baby Driver just because of the Subaru in the trailer, like that Subaru Was Impreza. Was that what you Oh yeah, nice you're red a Subaru Su- guy. Yeah, I'm a Subaru guy. That's not a cross. Nice side. red Subaru Impreza, just drifting the shit out of it. I'm like, oh my god, I need to watch this film because it's Edgar Wright and Subarus. <laughs> Is it Subarus the whole time? No, it? it's only Subaru for the opening scene, and then I'm massively okay. disappointed car wise. But um, in terms of dude, the opening uh, scene where it's a uh, classic house. It's a sequ- it's a sequence shot, so it's uh, a yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, plastic house on a like steady cam, and uh, the is it a uh, star of the film? Yeah, the star of the film is just walking around, going to get coffee, and singing to oh, that's the the music in his ears. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they move around, but the graffiti in the city say the lyrics. Yeah. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's that's gorgeous. so sick, man. Yeah. I remember I, that. Edgar Wright. Okay, favorite directors. Let's go. Uh, my favorite. Number one is Edgar Wright. He's just like oh, literally he's number one. He's number one for me. I'm a big comedy guy. Um, he, is, he is the best. He's he the is. best at visual comedy I think there ever was. Yeah. Um, I think Wright. I think I respect comedy enough for me to make this guy number one. 
Um, after that, I'd, I'd probably put Tarantino, and then I'd probably put Aronofsky, Boys. and then I'd probably put Matt Rich. <laughs> <laughs> no! Oh, where's your end? It's, uh, and then uh, David Fincher is uh, the one Four. No. Where's the, where's but the they're always favorite? fighting for number one. They're always fighting for number one. Yeah. I, or two. I, I don't have any Edgar Wright posters. Is that what you were going to say? That's what I was going to say. You have the queen. Then. Yeah, I have the queen. Uh, <laughs> no Edgar <laughs> uh, Top three? Yeah, top three. Go for it. Okay. Uh, so I would have... I don't know if I'll... I, I won't order it because yeah, I don't yeah, yeah. Like number one. No, ever. exactly. But, uh, I, like I said, they always fight for it. I'm like, these are just the top guys to me. It's like oh, after, and after, Villeneuve. After, and Villeneuve. Ooh. Oh, yeah. After, like, it's one of those things where it's like, after a Tarantino film, he's yeah. number one. Exactly. After an Aronofsky <laughs> film, he's number one. Well, that's what I'm saying. They're always fighting for it. Yeah. They're always... Depends <laughs> on who you watch yeah. last. Uh, I would say Scorsese. That's yeah. for, like... I gotta get into Scorsese. I yeah. think I'm gonna agree to, with you eventually. I... Yeah. That, well, that dude, like, that was, that guy was, like, really profound for me just because, like, he was the first dude who, like, kind of made me understand, like, kind of, you know the first time you saw film language? Like, yeah, the first yeah. time you the got first time it, you got it. You got yeah, it. yeah, totally. Like, that's that guy because he to was... That was Hitchcock, but... Really? Yeah. Well, uh, it's because yeah. I had a film history class where we only did Hitchcock. Babs. Yeah, I had, uh... There you go, Dan Babs. Yeah. Uh, dude, this fucking guy, you know he had a PhD in filmmaking? Not about the use of stairs, stairs in filmmaking. Yeah, that was his thing. <laughs> How cool is he that? He made us read uh, excerpts from his uh, yeah. from his uh, thesis. I noticed. I, I noticed the thing in Hitchcock's uh, work that he didn't notice before. He was like, he was impressed by it. He was like, damn man, that's really you did. Good. Yeah, I noticed uh, his use of uh, paintings in his films. He would have scenes uh, where there's a conversation and there's paintings in the back of the scene that represent the current situation in the film. So they would have this, like, there's this painting with, like, dogs and, like, royalty, and it was basically how this is the rich man uh, yeah. giving the bread to the poor man. You, thing, you right? rolling up on Babs with that is, like, like going up to Einstein going, like, yo, you made a mistake <laughs> in your equation right there. That's, like, a Thanks huge for the thing, compliment, uh, but I felt very proud about noticing it. I felt yeah, very good proud job, about shit, noticing man. it. Yeah. Um, no, but, Babs yeah. was an impressive dude. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you had. That's uh, interesting that Hitchcock was your because well, yeah, for, that, for a modern palette to say that is yeah. like a funny thing. Well, I was kind of forced into it, you know, because yeah, yeah. of you know Babs. But you, yeah, he was. Cool. Um, that was a great class. Screen studies. I love. I love that class. class. Yeah, yeah, it's true. We went to school together. We didn't go to school. Well, not together, yeah, there, but yeah. in the same building. Both had Babs. Yeah, the Babs. Um, but yeah, I would say so. Back to the director thing, Scorsese, because Babs of the, to the director thing. What? <laughs> Not worry about it. Oh, I made a shit yeah, joke. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that was a deep one. Um, yeah, I remember actually speaking of Babs. I, I remember writing a pa- we had to write some paper uh, yeah. about yeah. something or other, and really I used one. I used uh, I got all artsy with it, and I was like the use of uh, Scorsese's Madonna whore complex because wow. there, there was that in a lot That's of his films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like this. It was so deep, and I remember mm-hmm. he wrote on my paper. He's like. Bro, you went way too deep here, man. Like this paper was like about like whatever, and I was like, he still gave me like a great grade. Okay, that's good. Like, that's that's what was good about Dabs. <laughs> ba- yeah. ba- like he would, he'd recognize like, okay, this guy's motivated. He he doesn't deserve to lose any points. Yeah, he was yeah, yeah. Too motivated. I for sure rambled on. I for sure it was probably like a <laughs> thing like this because yeah. I was discovering the whole thing. You know, like yeah. you, you know when you're like a sort of a college kid or whatever, and you're first learning about the fucking yeah. issues in the world, and you're like, I, I feel everything more than you, you know? Like, yes, that was that was me, man. That was me then, because I was like, because I was discovering this stuff, I just felt like I was the first dude to like walk on the moon. You know? <laughs> so yeah. I would go crazy with all the symbolism and all that yeah. bullshit. Same. Um, but anyways, yeah, so, so Scorsese, for sure. Yeah. And then, probably this dude, man, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, because of this mother. dude is not a dude. This dude is a chick, but the dude who yeah, made this film. <laughs> that's a creature. It's not a dude or a chick. Dude, um, this is one of my favorite actresses, and the thing about her, Natalie Portman, is uh, how great was her performance in Black Swan? In but day. then, no, no, how bad was her performance in Star Wars? Oh <gasps> yeah, but dude, that's that's. Yeah. That's George Lucas is exactly. one of the worst directors That's ever. reaching at the bottom <laughs> of the bucket. So what about this? And I'm like, I forgot. I left that down on the bottom it's for It's crazy. I grew up with Lucas as being like, Star Wars were my favorite films, right? The I grew up with that, of course. When you were a kid. Yeah. Of course. I grew up with Star Wars being my favorite films. And then, like, going into filmmaking, I was like, this guy 
kind of sucks though. Yeah. <laughs> and and then you learn about how like four, five, six, like the prequels were good because he wasn't in charge and he had yeah. a producer to say like, no, could you please not write like a suit? But he didn't even do, he did direct those. But man. he didn't exactly. So that's you know, and, or write them. <laughs> he, he created. Created. He's he created the universe and yeah. then. But if you look at the originals, if I'm not mistaken, and, I don't think he wrote them. Yeah. Like the screenplays, he wrote it's story by created. Well, no, I don't say that in movies, but story by. Yeah. But he's not director or writer. He might That's be crazy. writer, director on the sixth one. But the sixth one is like kind of the most sellout one of yeah. the prequels with the Ewoks <laughs> and all that shit. Yes. So you're like, Ugh. and then one was all him, and you're like, Ugh. yeah. Ugh. But dude, you know that's a funny thing about movies, like. I, I have it I have it really bad sometimes because when you revisit a thing I, I think yeah. a movie changes oh, in your so esteem much. and, and all, in your regard every four or five years if you come back to a film yeah. four or five years later you're a different person than who watched it the first uh, time there's a theory I, I place that number at seven years uh, I have uh, like oh, I, I very specifically and that's here's, good. here's it my reason is, no. here's my reason um, I've had interesting conversations with lots of folk. Like I had a, con- I had personally like one relationship that made it almost to seven years, and it stopped at that point. Um, I've been in long relationships, uh, but then so that was one thing that happened to me. And then I talked to this old timer. Uh, I was like, uh, this guy's been like gripping like uh, on sets for like thirty years. He's been married for like thirty one years or something. Um, and this guy's like, you know, honestly, like every seven years. I, me and my wife have had like a really hard patch to go through because the thing is humans change every seven years on average here's why because s- on the cellular level I, didn't think you were this deep. I will get very great, deep man. I will get cellular level deep on a cellular level every seven years there's not a single cell in your body that is the same than seven years ago that's crazy how crazy is that so relationships tend to correlate with about a seven year problem and then your film perspective tends to change. There's a fucking Marilyn Monroe film called The Seven Year Itch, and it's about that. It's a, well, so it's cool. Yeah. I'm obsessed by this concept. I don't know what to do with it yet, but like it's a really fascinating phenomenon to me. That that I, might be it, man. That might be it because yeah. every time I, I can't tell you like when I've revisited a film from you know like, but there's a lot of them, and I can name you a few. But like there's a lot of them that I used to hold in super high regard. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> I would, like, let's say with a with an ex-girlfriend or whatever, I'd be like, you have to fucking watch and Forrest Gump. It. <laughs> and then I rewatched it, and Forrest Gump is one of them. So, like, because yeah. to me, Forrest Gump, back in the day, was, like, an adult film. Yeah. Because I remember I, after school, in, like, grade school, like, the, you know, grade two, three, whatever, I, I used to take chess, like, let's say chess classes outside of school every, uh, like, let's say Wednesday or whatever. And... The, so school is that there, why you're so buff? Because you'd get bullied to do chess, and you're like, I'm going to get so No, I'm just buff from the chess. <laughs> oh, okay. It's it's fucking heavy pieces. Heavy pieces, <laughs> yeah. Really. But um, no, so um, <laughs> school would end like at like four or whatever, and yeah. the dude who did the chess classes was like in some other school or whatever, and the time it took him to come this, to our school was like, let's say an hour. So from four to five, I would be in the library. Me and the chess crew, we would be in the library, and the librarian would like kind of take care of us, and every now mm-hmm. and then she'd put on a movie, and a couple times it was Forrest Gump, and I remember watching it. And then at one point it was the scene where uh, Forrest. Did you see? You, you see Forrest Gump? I have, but I have concussions, so I don't really don't remember. Sure. <laughs> I don't remember. Sure. It's whatever. It's the. Uh, yeah. I mean, you should just for America. I should revisit it. I should definitely yeah. revisit it. Um, but anyway, like at one point, like Forrest Gump is like sitting on Jenny's bed, and like uh, she like takes off her top, and she's like, "You ever been with a woman, Forrest?" And he's just like all like freaked out, and she like puts her hand, his hands on her boobs, and yeah. he's just like all weird and everything. And I remember when it got to that scene, Miss Stern, the librarian, would go like, "Oh, that's not for children," and she'd turn it off. And I was like, Shit. "She knew. She put it on twice. She knew. She put it on more than twice, man. It was like, <laughs> I think it was the same. It was that in Braveheart, weirdly, that she would put on for us. And it was always shit that she'd have to get up and yeah. stop because at one point, Forrest goes to Vietnam and it gets kind of violent. Not really, but it kind of gets violent. Mm-hmm. She would always, like, because she'd be doing other shit, like she'd be writing stuff or whatever. And then when she'd see that it was getting gnarly on screen, she would like, because there's like seven year olds, she would like turn it off. But because she did that, I was like, oh, this yeah, movie yeah. is like it's like forbidden kind it's of thing. It's forbidden. Yeah, yeah. I had a curiosity exactly. To and uh, so then when I, I don't know, I ended up getting to see it like years later or whatever and I felt like it was 
I don't know, like it more important than it was, mm. and uh, and also just that, that was gone. Yeah, that like little magic to it was gone, kind of. Well, thing. no, no. So when I got to see a few years later, it was like my favorite film ever because okay. I don't know. It was like a, it, it felt like a mature adult film, and I, mm. I thought I was worldly because I'd seen it. Because Forrest Gump goes through all of American history. That's yeah. kind of the story. It's like this kind of retard guy who like goes across. We don't say that anymore. Yeah, uh, kind of. I find it hilarious. <laughs> I say it all the time. I don't care. But what, it's for it's <laughs> in reference to Forrest Gump. It's it, it's fine. He's, but Forrest it, Gump it's, is a, it's a dim-witted guy yeah, of course. going through the course of American history from like the 60s to the whatever 90s or something yeah. and uh, but anyway, so I felt cultured and everything and then I would watch mm-hmm. it every now and then but then there was a gap of time I guess seven years from when I was like you know 17 <laughs> to 24 and I remember yeah. watching it again with my ex I was like had you seen we got to talking and I she'd never seen Forrest Gump and I was mm-hmm. like oh my fucking god we gotta Come watch it and I was so excited because yeah, it had yeah. been a lapse of time since I've seen my but favorite then. film ever or whatever so when I watched it again, at this point I was like way older and I had gone through film school and everything yeah. and it just, I don't know, I watched it with new eyes and it was the corniest fucking thing ever. Yeah. I was just not into it at all and I was like, yeah. oh shit, this is actually schlock. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Yeah, a lot of things, well, there's multiple factors in there. There's a couple of things, like you might change tar- target demographics when you grow up, so there's one thing, that's, right? That's a big one. Um, but so 70 to the, the, well, the issues that you're dealing with directly are no longer the same. So the touching a woman's breast for the first time, you're like, do you like this film, honey? <laughs> I like this film, honey. Oh, wait, I've got two honeys. I should have not... Uh, I thought so this now you're was watching on. that scene like it ain't shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, so there's that. You, you know it doesn't go get you as much as it would because you're not in the target demo. The other thing, same thing about the Tarantino film, is that you're not discovering a new universe, so it's not as like mystical when you're just, when you're like immersed in the film. Yeah, yeah, I find yeah. there's just some many factors to it. But there's something about the greats though, which oh, yeah. is like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Aronofsky. You're right, you're right, you're right. Like the thing is, yeah. what I find great about that Absolutely is right. some films that are not as substantial as you thought yeah. will pale to as you get older. Yeah, but exactly. there, there are some that will stand the test. Well, there's some that get like wine that get finer because you go, I fucking didn't notice that. And also because maybe at the point that you saw it, the character was going through, let's say the older character in the film mm-hmm. was going through something, you, seven years later, you're now at that person's age, you go, I kind of know what he's going through. So they mature with you, whereas some others pale. Yeah. And that, that was the case. So this guy, I mean, I'll, I'll rewatch, I think most of his films yeah. will age with me. Yeah, I I haven't rewatched a single Aronofsky film where I rewatched it and I was like, why the fuck did I like this? No, it no, hasn't that's the thing. It, it's oh yeah, this is why I don't watch this anymore because they're brutal. Um, but no, there's not a single film. You're right. Um, you have to space them out because we said of how heavy they are. Yeah. But I think that uh, that's actually a good thing. I like a film that I can't rewatch for it. at least a year Love because it. it means that it's affected you. If yeah. it was heavy, it means you were invested. And if it was heavy, it means that that's what they it were means that It means that you've received something through the film, right? If exactly. it was heavy and you're like, nope, don't want to do that anymore, it's because you received something. You're, you've yeah. been influenced by it. The, the message got across somehow. Maybe it didn't, but it caught you viscerally. So, like, yeah. I find that films are a powerful thing. They're so yeah, they're powerful. When, when, it, when they're done at the level of these oh. years behind me? What's One that? thing that I've, uh, well, I would consider... Uh, Fincher and to be the same level. He, Fincher is definitely a master. One yeah. one criticism yeah. I have about Fincher, though, I don't like that he only does uh, he piggybacks on popular stories. He's a really good director, but I mean, look at his film Fight Club, huge novel. book. Uh, what did you say? Awful. Novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. it was uh, <laughs> garbage. Uh, yeah, Fight Club, very popular book. Yes. Facebook. Yeah. Everyone's gonna go watch a film about Facebook. That's so. True. My criticism of him is also Gone like was nice job, bud. Like you're basically a very smart commercial filmmaker, but artistic commercial filmmaker, and that's one of the things that I respect. It comes from commercials, the commercial music video. I know, I know. Uh, a lot of my favorite directors do, and well, that's the model that I'm trying to imitate. Is that yeah. uh, it's the music videos, commercials, films. It is the perfect route. entry. To me, it's the perfect route. Is that's what I'm trying to do, and it's just. Um, I have zero disrespect for commercials. I find them very annoying uh, to watch sometimes because there's so many bad ones. But I want to make the good ones that are that are fun, that are uh, they're just an exercise in style, or they're um, that you can do so many things with commercials, and, and you can yeah. really test out stuff, and you can play with really expensive gear that it's, you normally I, I wouldn't think, be think, able to play with. I think commercials for us are like it. our gym. Yeah. You literally go to work out there. Like, totally. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and that's I, a good analogy. I like it. Yeah. 
I, I think uh, I agree with you, and I think that uh, there's an artistry in there's the thing so is like there's artistry. most of them. I don't watch a lot of like you know programmed television, yeah. and neither does a lot, do a lot of people these days. But um, I really don't. But whenever it happens that I do, or I walk, or I walk by somebody watching something, and it cuts to commercials, ninety five percent of them are fucking awful yeah, exactly and yeah if not more yeah, because exactly. i don't even think tv is the platform for really artistic commercials anymore no. there's way more web platforms and stuff i don't but even then web platforms with interesting commercials like when's the last time you saw an interesting web commercial that wasn't tv well you just, you'd have to basically just They're directly rare. youtube it <laughs> yeah which is weird because you're seeking out the commercials yeah. But, uh, well, I do that with perfume commercials. <laughs> I've been like, yeah. I've got a huge document with like, I've got dozens of perfume commercials that I love. I'd have to, I'm not the biggest thing. aficionado of those. I don't know, it, I don't offhand, can, can't really think of one. I got like, it, I can't name any like film stars. But there's some, art, there's some but, ones yeah. with integrity, like some of them are well, good. One of my favorites is, uh, is uh, Kenzo World um, by the director, why do I, Spike Jones. Oh world. man, that dude! A, I love Spike Jones. Yeah. God, I love that guy. He did a perfume commercial. He did a great perfume commercial. Guy, it's a man. five minute. Like he's one of my biggest inspirations. He did like a five minute uh, with this dancer. I think she's like, she's her style is kind of like um, uh, what's that style where they do like whatever? God damn it! Why am I contemporain? Uh, and with like a little bit of the classic ballet style dance, but it's very like weird. And the girl is weird the whole way through, and it's like this classy event that she's got to be really classy and formal, and like everyone's like, oh! But this girl, like, she's like, I gotta slip out of here, this place is awful. And she slips out and just like, she, he just captures that like random little emotion of just like, this place is really uptight, I'm gonna be silly. And then she just dances and it just goes like really crazy, and he's got like dubstep on it, and like it's just the wildest thing. I love he did it. an Apple one that, that yeah, kind of recently. Me. Yeah, he you, works with Dance a lot. You saw that one, then? Yeah, I work the, with Dance a lot, which I'm like, how yeah. cool is this guy? Like, yeah, those are incredible. You know, the yeah. Apple commercial is phenomenal. That one's insane. Phenomenal. One's the logistics on it, the, the budget, the whoa. Uh, yeah, they really just told him to do whatever the fuck they want. He wanted, I'm sure. He's at that sure level. He's at that level that oh, where he could do that. He, that guy has such a track record of like, he, him and in the 90s dude. and early 2000s, him so and uh, the French dude, the guy who did uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, okay. Gondry, Michel okay. Gondry. Him and Michel Gondry were making the dopest fucking music videos. Mm. Like, uh, he was working... The Christopher Walken music video? That's him. That's oh him. my god, yeah, he's so exactly. good. Fat Boy Slim. Yeah, uh, Fat Boy Slim. He, he so did, good. He did uh, Beastie Boys music yeah. videos. Like, the early, like, Sabotage. The good ones. Yeah, Intergalactic. Yeah. Um, and he did... And Gondry had the White Stripes oh, back okay. in the day. Uh, Bjork. They did shit. the dopest shit. shit. And so they... He... Dude, Jones comes from Jackass. He did Jackass. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, wait, Spike Jones. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. Spike Jones. Well, he comes from skateboarding originally. Yeah. He he's, exactly, uh, exactly. He was sponsored, I think, as a skateboarder for a certain time. Like he was a good skateboarder, but then he filmed for Girl, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which was like a, a a company, and they put out movies. Okay. And um, he was the guy who directed the Girl movies, if I'm not mistaken, it's Girl. Um, and then after that, he went on to doing music videos and Jackass. And well, then, Jackass was before. And then he was yeah, like the dude. Right. And then I think he did the first Jackass movie. Mm. Or maybe I'm, I'm. I think it was probably at the same period as he was doing skateboard movies because yeah, the yeah, same definitely. scene. Jackass was the same scene. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, he. Um, but it's funny going back to the commercials though, because I, I kind of have a good vantage point for this because that's kind of. Yeah. I'm in it right now too. Commercials. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing more like uh, gaffer stuff. Like gaffer, I'm driving uh, a truck. Yeah. I'm like. I'm more observing right now, but yeah. I'm getting ready to pitch. <laughs> for, for? Um, I just want to get, like, I did do Jesu, which is a spoof commercial, and won awards for it. Like, I'm at a point where I should really be seeking out people and being like, hey, I want to make commercials, but I'm too much of a bitch to actually contact people. So, really? Uh, well, I can see you knocking, tearing down doors. And I should. I, I'm just not proactive. I kind of, ex I don't expect things to come to me. I just put things out in the world and hope that people come towards me but I, I see people who are proactive and contact me for example and they're like oh we should meet and do this I'm like that's really fucking impressive of you yes let's do it I and then I'm like I why don't I way. do that like I should do that I should be proactive I should be knocking at doors but I don't but I'm at a point right now where I'm going to start doing that that's um but like to 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 to, to go to commercials and this actually might might yeah, be yeah. something that, that might be useful for you because like 
Yeah, it, that's like a lot of what I do, yeah. like uh, commercials and all kinds. All, I mean, you've seen a, a number of them. Yeah. And uh, but what what's really funny is that I have a funny story, man. Like, because um, it's uh, it's a kind of so we have one client, which I guess I'm not gonna name there. Just yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, you actually you on worked on one with us. Yeah. With it, but don't don't name it if you remember. Uh, but you worked on a commercial for this client, but it's not the commercial that I'm talking about. That I'm going to make okay. an example of. Okay. It was one that we did like a year before I'll that, but it was, they were they were a big client. And so when I started where I work, uh, we had we got the gig to do a commercial for them, and it was like kind of like a big break for me because yeah. it was like a big shoot, and we we're gonna have yeah. like crew, and they're we we're gonna stay at it, it was in Mont Tremblant. We got this big ass house, and uh, I was just like super happy to DP it. We were gonna shoot on red and yeah, all this yeah. shit. And so, like, we got there, and I was taking it super seriously. I was, like, looking at references, yeah. and I wanted to kill it. Yeah, yeah, And we did do a good job. Yeah. And, but that was not, that's not where the problems lie, actually. Uh, so, anyway, it was, like, uh, the, the shoot went well. It was, like, a two-day shoot up in Trombla, where we, like, kind of redecorated the house with all this stuff from the client that hired us. And then we did the thing, and then I edited it. So, I was, like, putting it together just as passionately, and I was really, really wanting to kill that, too. Yeah. And we ended up sending it out. It was a success. And everybody at work after the project was finished, as soon as I clicked, as soon as whoever clicked send to the yeah. client, it's like the project never existed. And it was like, well, it's over. You don't need to think about it. And I was like, I was like, boy, I kind of want to see what we did, how it impacted, in a weird way, like yeah. the culture. You know, like what was the result in the market? Yeah. What was the, well, that's yeah. that's kind of what we do. But I felt like the concentration. At, in the office was more like well, you guys the are, gig itself. You guys are a factory. You got to roll them out one after the other, right? Yeah, we we are, but like it's still like you know, there everything that you put out there in a way is culture, you know, and it's what people are going to consume oh, yeah. wherever this thing goes. It's going to be consumed by people, and it's going to you know chip away at their worldview. It's going to inform yeah. their worldview. So I yeah, think yeah. it's important to see how this thing plays out when you send it out. So I clicked on it and everybody was kind of in agreement. And that's... An agreement on terms of what? In terms of? The message or the quality or the... No, it was nothing to do with quality. Everybody was saying, oh, it's a nice ad. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a nice that's ad. Fun, man. But I don't necessarily... At that point, I was concerned about just... You know when you like kind of... like I wasn't just starting out, but I was just starting out at that company. So I was like yeah. very concerned with just the making of it, the the yeah. logistics of it, and, and successfully getting one under your belt. Yeah. But I didn't think about, like, because it, it's the easiest thing, at our level anyway, to make a nice-looking thing, to to, yeah. to, to to kill that part of it. Mm -hmm. But then I was reading the comments, and even when I showed my mom the commercial, before it was out, she said a comment that I, 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 hadn't, I didn't forget, and I still haven't forgotten, and she goes, Oh, it's a good pub, but it's a bit elitist, no? And I was like, elite. Oh. I was like, how? And I, and I, at the time, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, but you know, you're not a filmmaker. You don't know anything, and whatever. But that's the it. opinions that like really matter because oh, that yeah. word transcends the the filmmaking. It encapsulates the whole thing into one word. Yeah, right? it's elitist. It's like oh, here are all the elements falling into one place. Bing. Elitism. Exactly. Oh, and and fuck. to me, we had worked we had worked way too yeah. hard on it to, for it to be boiled down to yeah. one word like that. Totally. So I was like, oh, how dare you, whatever. But then yeah. when I looked at the Facebook comments, that's what they were all saying too. Not mm -hmm. as dismissively as that. They were like basically saying like, oh, it's a real, because basically the commercial were was. Were you, sorry, were you involved in the conception or were no. only the DP? Or no, no, just DP. Gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyways, I, so the, the commercial was basically... Uh, this family it's like a Sunday or sorry it's like a weekday evening or whatever and the family is all running back to the house for, for dinner so the dad comes home kisses the wife on the forehead goes to change mm. mom and daughter are making papa dans la cuisine you know and then the mm. two kids are like kind of running they were playing outside in the leaves and they're running back in and it's this super idealistic yeah. thing yeah. and so and in this giant house and all of those people are just white as can be they're ivory white mm -hmm. and they're all like the kid the, like the two of them are like super Aryan looking you know, like we were <laughs> going for that, it seemed yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and I didn't think Pick about that on. when we were making, when we were making, because I was thinking about the focus and the lighting and all that yeah. stuff, but then when it was out there, I looked at the comments and they were all going, they are all saying, um, yeah, it's, it's a great little, oh, I bet it's food, man, they're selling a lifestyle that's unattainable, and I was like, that really well, stuck with well, me. Well, it depends also, like, that's the thing, the thing with commercials which sucks, 
is that you don't have the control on the brand's image, right? So the brand's image that's, is unattainable that is because that's their market. They're not into dealing in poor, in, into yeah. like cheap products, right? So it, it's like, I find that's kind of out of your control. The problem with that client from that project on, because yeah. they've been a repeat client for years, for me, the struggle has, since I saw those YouTube, those Facebook yeah. comments, I've tried to encrust myself into the conceptualization of the subsequent ones, and I've never been able to, but it's been my mission to do a really poignant one, because I think, because you're right, the problem was not us, it was the palette of the client. Yeah. They wanted a super idealistic thing. So I think you did your job good, but it's... Yeah, but branding. what's weird is branding. feeling like part of the propaganda, you know? Because yeah. that it yeah. was like my lens that did that. It was yeah. my well, literally hands holding the Ronin, yeah. literally. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I'm kind of a cog in that wheel. And I was like, shit, I wonder if I can, from my vantage point how from you, here. How do you feel about like being a cog in the wheel? Because like me personally, I. I have limits, like I won't do like a white supremacist video or something, like, uh, but you know, there is a limit. Had a twenty thousand dollar budget. Or something. Well, that, that's the thing. I do it. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> right, we got Tom on camera <laughs> admitting to it. Okay, twenty twenty, get this guy in jail. This is, he admitted to what? <laughs> Not in jail, man. I can do it. I, I'm just a subcontractor. I don't well, need to agree. Well, that's the issue. That's, I like the shit so, out of it. So, <laughs> so that's the issue is that well, if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it, and there's a budget, right? And you become a cog in the wheel, and sometimes like, like you don't do the projects you want to do. And I was doing this one recently with uh, a political party, which I really hate. Oh shit! And uh, I'm not gonna say the party, um, but let's just say that it's a party in Quebec that is very solitary at the moment. Gotcha. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> oops! And uh, it you was a, a weird experience. I didn't do it as a director, but I was on the set, and I was like, okay, today. I shut my mouth and I do my job. Like, what I don't what, what was the? Was it like a politician to talk in a camera or something? Or? It was a TV thing. Yeah, I don't want to go into too much detail, okay, okay, but it was okay. a, it was a pretty like it was a pretty good campaign thing, like through an ad agency and stuff, and like, and I was like, should I like? I'm like, of course I'm going to do this because like, if it's not me, it's going to be somebody else. So why money. wouldn't I do it? And it's money, and yeah. like, why wouldn't I do it? But. Yeah, you're just a cog in the wheel, and it's like, yeah, you do it, but I want to get to the point where I'm not a cog in the wheel, but to get up to a point where you're you're the guy running it, but you got to be a cog in the wheel a bit. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool with it. I don't mind it. I was super respectful, and I was like, yeah, sure, and didn't talk politics, and it's like, it's part of the game until you're this motherfucker, Tarantino or Aronofsky, yeah. and you do whatever the fuck you want. I don't necessarily aspire to be the the guy calling the shots necessarily. I don't need to be like running a studio or even You've got the or... absolute DOP profile. Yeah. You're, you're, you're DOP profile. Yeah, that's it. Like, I, the thing is like I do, the ideal eventually is still too direct, but right now I'm just you too want to deep. Yeah. I didn't know you didn't, I yeah. didn't know you wanted to direct. That's what I studied for my time in film school. That's mm -hmm. what I, that's what I studied, but I just kind of discovered in the directing profile cinematography yeah. and I'm really deep in wanting to not master it but get to a level of mastery of the craft yeah. which I don't like I'm not there yet but I'm very much forging in the right direction that. for sure yeah. Yeah. and that's but eventually I would like to to jump over and, and mm. to direct I, I would I would love to do that I mean I directed a music video just last weekend yeah that, that's one that I actually directed and you know we're all yeah, yeah. and everything but uh yeah it felt great to get something out there and that is the the goal but I I still, yeah, D DPing is kind of where I want to reside and not necessarily be the, the, the shot caller. Well, I yeah. think, well, I think like there's two shot callers, it's the DP and it's the director, but yeah, the, the director gets the final But I meant say. shot caller in terms of like not being a cog in the wheel, like, you know, yeah. kind of yeah. being a fucking, you know, common shots. Yeah, exactly. Like mm. being like a prime mover. But know? it's, it's even then like the, when you're DP, or even director in commercials, you're not calling the shots. Yeah, the that's, client is, right? That's the funny. Yeah. So I think it's a good, like else. you said, I think it's a good gym. Like you can work out your muscles and stuff. But like, yeah. And I mean, you know a lot about working out your muscles. Like you fucking swole as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, it, when you're actually calling the shots is when you're independent director. But even then, like, 
you don't call you're the shots because you your producer's got a limited budget for you, and he's he's like, oh, well, here are the budgetary constraints, and if you do that, well, this investor is going to drop out, and like, yeah, so yeah. You, I mean, it's very rare that you can actually call the fucking shots. That's why commercials is a good way to come up because you learn very much how to kind of cater to everybody, yeah. dodge a lot of bullets, and still yeah. try to maintain all yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. why it's a really totally. good thing because anything outside, like I think, it's a most, great training ground. I think yeah. for that. Yeah, that that and that and music videos probably I would say. Music videos are, are a different little beast because they're the people who hire you for music videos they're unless you're going conscious. through an agency. Uh, they don't deal the same way. They're struggling artists and they're like yeah. uh, they don't deal the same way. I don't know. Yeah, it's different. You're not gonna I, get the I same just, dynamic. I'd rather as big I'd rather that than like, you know the the kind of trenches of like. Because there's always like you know in commercials there's dealing with. The product they're selling and yeah. that's probably the biggest bummer in ter- like you know like yeah. product shots making sure yeah, the product yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, there's like all that stuff that I just Pack find shots. so redundant yeah, man. Yeah, like yeah, I totally. just don't like that form it's so constraining to do yeah you know so like that I'm not the biggest fan of music videos yeah I guess that's like, oh, like image it. of the group image of the singer whatever but you can go in any direction you can do a western you can do a yeah. sci-fi you can do an abstract you I mean we I, I, I just cool. did a music video a couple I guess two months ago or something where we shot it um, anamorphic and we were like the, the director was going for the most amount of aberrations possible okay he wanted it sloppy yeah like, yeah, hey, yeah. like not like what we just saw yeah, like, you yeah. see an anamorphic flare in there but other than that you know you don't is, there's not that many yeah. the, the presence of the anamorphic so did you go for like an anamorphic with like a converter like well a, we did first okay. yes yes we shot with uh, diopters okay and uh, we shot on the hawk anamorphics open all the way so you, you do, to the point where you can't even tell <laughs> what the fuck is in focus uh, and it turned out really well it, it turned out really great did you have a, a, a what are uh, camera system pulling focus or were you pulling yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. no no, no. Okay. There, there, there was like yeah I was pulling focus but while like, DPing yeah, yeah. but, but not, um, not not operating okay. okay so but basically um, it was like it's that's the opposite of a flattering format for the face yeah. right and it's a music video is for like a, a standalone artist and uh, like we were getting like fucking uh, like he, right here sometimes and I was like damn man and I don't think I don't think that uh, there was like any problems with like her image I mean I wasn't part of the feedback and edited or whatever yeah, yeah. but like I that wasn't I, I stayed tuned with like the editing kind yeah. of uh, workflow and it was just content stuff that was the feedback well, I think so she didn't care about yeah. the distortion-y stuff and she didn't really it wasn't about that so you know, there was a lot more freedom because I, I, I thought about this and I was like shooting this format on some of the commercials that we get, there's no fucking way that I could yeah, that I could have fun. proposed that even. Yeah. Yo, so. I've been I've been like my approach is I've I've been dodging companies. <laughs> I've got like probably since I went freelance I got like four or five different offers for like full time work at like production companies. Oh, no and, kidding. Like, yo, I got really? one of the Yeah man. I got one of the first offers I got was it was an interview, but like I got offered to work at the Canadian Space Agency. I knew a girl on the on the inside. As what? As they needed an in-house an video astronaut. guy. <laughs> yeah, they're like, dude, dude, you look like Don't you be can an handle the bro. <laughs> um, as what? As a in-house uh, video producer. So basically, I would oh, be okay. the full production editor. Do you, like, and uh, it, it's like really high starting salary, like ridiculous. Like, what conference are they? The, the internal stuff, uh, some web content, uh, stuff like that, and um, where, where would this have been? Uh, it's in Saint Hubert, I think, the Canadian Space Agency. What? Yeah. Wait, Saint Hubert? Dude, this is a Canadian Space Agency. Okay, this isn't NASA. <laughs> we're in Saint Hubert. I don't know, like Manitoba <laughs> or something. Know. Yeah, it's in Saint Hubert. Uh, well, I mean, at, at least one headquarters that I know about is there. I don't think the Canadian arm is built there, but there's they have headquarters and. Oh, shit. Yeah, and um, so I was like invited to, for an interview, and I had a girl on the inside, and I was like, dude, I'm gonna nail this interview. Like, if I go, I'm good at interviews. If I go to a job, I generally get it because of the interview, despite yeah. all my other like stuff. And uh, <laughs> it's like you know, <laughs> uh, answering I beat women in interviews. Yeah. Uh, but he was charming. <laughs> he was charming. Uh, and I'm like, dude, I'm obsessed with the stars and planets and I have a fucking like 9.5 inch dis- that means in, you're like, committed as fuck to this lifestyle so committed to it because here's what I want to say is that my approach has been I need to stay freelance so that I have full control of what I want to do 
here's where I get full control is basically I work super hard. I put money aside, I've invested some stuff, and blah, blah, blah. But every once in a while, it's like, not, not taking contracts right now, I'm making a film. And yeah. every, like, every time I did that, it's just been so beneficial. Like, Unlocked was the first one that I did recently, yeah. and that you were on, and, and I mean, fucking, I'm a Hollywood uh, winning director. Hey, baby. <laughs> it's so funny to say. <laughs> and there was like no one in the festival, and it was a small festival, but, you know, it's still cool. Uh, Which and festival then, was it? Was it NYLA? No, it was uh, uh, it was a dance film festival. Oh, okay, I'm okay, the okay. worst okay, names. Sorry, was, and it was their first year. The organization was great, but it was there wasn't a big turnout. Um, but it was a really cool experience. And then that sort of like gave me the juice to keep going. I did the Jesus, and then recently I got selected for another film festival in Montreal. But like I've been just taking the time, investing my own money into making my own films. And doing a hundred percent what I want to do. You don't think like, with that full time job you would have been able to? I would. I would have struggled with time, so I would have been for sure. Yeah. When I when you come back from work and you've been working on the company's contracts, right. you kind of want to disconnect a bit, right? You're not gonna sit at home and think about your projects, and, and you're spending a lot of time there, so you're not spending time on your projects, and that's why I didn't take that route. Um, yeah, and I know what you mean. Unlocked was like. Yeah, kind of rough for me because like yeah, you were you squeezed that one in, huh? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I took like a one day off work, I think Friday, Monday, whatever. Yeah, Monday. I think we shot on Monday. We did. Um, it was like Friday, Monday, Saturday, shoot. Sunday, Monday. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I took like one day off, but it was basically like two or three straight work weeks in a row without anything. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. like I wanted to do that one, and then you know it's like right after I finish that one, I can't just like you know like all like independent people like just kind of finish a gig and then just kind of sleep for a week yeah it was just like right back <laughs> but it was working like i was yeah. really really happy to do it but yeah. i know what you mean that film was weird like we um it was i feel i, I want to distribute it i want to redo the editing a bit and redistribute it because we got some cool shit in that film like yeah. it's a very unique weird film it's very niche but i feel like if we hit the right markets with it like the yeah. right festivals with this niche like it's a cool film. I think you should just like re-edit it not towards a, like a dance festival, mm. which is probably what you did, right? Yeah. So like, that, whatever that way that makes is. sense. Yeah. Um, but when I finish a project, I just move on. So <laughs> the idea know, of reopening man. the books for editing, I'm like, nope, next. Yeah, it's not, it's not the most <laughs> pleasing thing to do. I hate it. I need to, I'm at a point where I've realized I need to, well, so we were talking about delegating before. Like you're, oh, yeah. you're actually the first DOP I've delegated to. Um, I don't hire people unless I think they're better than me, and I've this told like you this. It's a funny statement. What? Well, it's like, no, <laughs> it's like a little bit like a virginity statement, you know? It's <laughs> like, I'm all like... You were my first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't delegate to people, like, I, I always say this, I don't hire anyone unless I think they're better than me, As, or else you wouldn't be hired. And that's yeah. like my approach, because or else it's like, I, I'm going to handle it then. Uh, I wouldn't have the confidence to let a person do his, his thing unless they're at least better than me and I'm not the best. Like I, I just, I've developed a certain level of skill that I want to be either matched or better. Yeah, um, yeah. And so what I've realized is like now I've been getting way better results by delegating to DOPs. Uh, and it's not that my, I feel like my DOP could be way stronger and I want to do the direction of photography a bit more these days. Um, but every time I have done it in my films, it's just I've been splitting hats. Um, yeah. So I don't even think you, in that case, know what your level is. I don't know what I'm capable of. That. I've exactly. never been able to be to DP with, sorry, with good equipment and 100% focus. I've never been able to do it. Um, so I, that's why right now, like one of my interests, I'll take any gig, I'll take any gig for free if you've got equipment. Cause don't I just say that, play. man, they'll hit you up. <laughs> <laughs> good equipment, okay, good equipment. Because go. I want to play around. I, I just want to, for fun, like I literally just want to develop myself. but. That's beside the point, but um, I'm at a point right now where I'm, I want to delegate an editor. I'm looking for an editor that's better than me. And that one's going to be tough for you too, tough man. One. That's going to be a That's a very tough one. one. I'm, I'm in a, I've won awards for editing. It's like I'm good. I find I'm a decent editor. Most of my job is editing. Most of the stuff here is paid for by editing contracts. Um, I don't like doing it, though. It is <laughs> good at it. Yeah, I don't like doing it. I'm not a big fan. It's just like it's a tedious process that, yeah, like I'll fucking get it done, and then yeah, like yeah, I get it know. done, but I get it done good because I'm such an obsessive comp like perfectionist. So that makes a lot of sense. But to I want to delegate. I think I uh, I don't 
edit as much anymore. It's mm -hmm. you know largely the, the the shooting and the cinematography. But like whenever I do it, because it, I, I I'm I'm also pretty good at it. But like you have, I think it's because you probably have a very strong film language. Which yeah, makes you a yeah, good editor. yeah 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 so for sure for sure. But also like the hating it part is like yeah. a super important part of the equation for me. The okay. hating it is weird because I have to be faced with a task of editing, yeah. I have to be faced with it and then struggle with it for like half a day or a whole day, sometimes even like a fucking week. Yeah. And then by hating it so much, I'll kind of like hate edit it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hate fuck edit it, you know? I love how we're like talking about uh, how virginity, like you were my first, and, and now we're talking about hate fucking the editing process. The whole world is a sexual allegory, man. <laughs> it but, is. Uh, but no, I think it's yeah. like, but the totally thing is, don't. like, but the thing is, like, I think what that adds to the edit, that level of kind of rebelling against it, is mm. the passion that you find in the edit. You know, it's like a weird thing. Oh, it's a very weird thing you said. Yeah, that. it's but a I, very weird thing because I'm very much like, if you look at my life, like in terms of what I've been doing, where I'm going, like, I tend to be a little rebellious. I tend to be like, I rather a fight than like. Like one of the weird things that's been happening for me recently is that I've had some directors and stuff that I really respect, like people that I look up to that have said like nice things about me, like really nice things yeah. about me that I've just been like, how do I deal with this? I, I'm way more used to just like fighting my way up, yeah. not fighting, but like I'm way more used to like grinding. showing up as the underdog and grinding, yeah, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's funny that you say that because that whole rebellious sort of way to attack editing is like... Hmm. Maybe that is why I'm it, editing is working for me. I, don't know. I, I think so, man. I, I think it's uh, it's like the struggle to it is because uh, when you're in that zone, you look at it a different way, right? You, yeah. Just, I, I don't know what it is, but it's like it, it's a little like uh, I mean, I'm super into fighting and like uh, into mixed martial arts, I should say. I know. I just think that's a really funny. You should. That should be your pickup line. You just I'm go to a bar and be like, <laughs> I'm super into fighting. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, no, I'm, su I'm super yeah. into MMA and have been yeah. in for years and boxing. Yeah. And uh, a lot, th there's a thing that a lot of the greats uh, um, echoes in a lot of them is uh, the idea that they actually despise fighting and that's what makes them great at it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like uh, the classic, the classic example is uh, GSP. Like mm. he's notorious yeah. backstage for being uh, ex like a ner uh, basically a little bitch before the fight, <laughs> wanting to run away, saying, "Why the fuck do I do this for a living?" What? He can't handle. I didn't it. know that about he him. He can't handle it. But that freak out for like an hour or two backstage is what buys him the call later. Huh? You know, like getting that out of the way. But it's the struggle against your craft that makes that's, you maybe find a re so maybe weird. maybe struggling. That's so weird. Yeah, yeah, I think that well, I think that struggle puts you in a place of like maybe a weird peace of mind of like I don't like this, but I got to do it. And when you're in the zone where you got to do it, you just I'm obsessed with finding focus, and you just something about that dynamic puts you in the zone where you're like, okay, execute the fastest possible so this can be over with, right? Okay, it so just makes yeah. you reach some sort it's of a zone that. which is effective. It's maybe that, or it's crazy. or there's like a, like let's say you're you're in a, like a couple and you have a fight. Sometimes the fight at the end of it, when you come around the other mm -hmm. side, makes you realize how much you love the person because you worked your way back to that point. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like the intensity of it when the dust settles, you refound why you're in love with that person. Yeah. Maybe it's something like that. And maybe that's... It's so that love-hate. It's a lot of love-hate, I yeah. think. I have love-hate for editing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that makes I think, sense. I think it's that in equal measure, and that's what makes you... Uh, get. But also, also, there's another part of the equation, which is like I think most of the stuff that we edit, we've shot. Yeah. Yeah. So that's part of like that's another part of the equation. But I still think like at the when I was faced with the task of editing my music video that I had just finished like the other day, mm -hmm. I was uh, man, I was like standing in front of the drives, going like uh, intimidated to start, right? Intimidated. Uh, but and, like a lot of other things, like like uh, I didn't want to do it. I was intimidated by it because it's just like a lot. You know, like when you shot shit with a, a lot of footage and you're like, I don't, I can't, I don't think I can fuck this. Dude, here's well, here's okay. I'm struggling right now. Like you look up there, look at all those cue cards. I'm writing my first feature film, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm writing my first feature film. That's and the way to do it, man. Yeah, well, that is yeah. the way to do it. And and uh, I also have there, I have um, basically a note, note board. So I, I note everything that I think is important. And I have another more complex process. But 
uh, everything but writing. I'm not writing the scenario. I'm like, <laughs> how far did I put again, this off? Because you got, yeah, that's because, what I'm talking yeah. about. But I've found that this, this technique actually works for me. Because here's the thing. I'm this sort of like pessimistic, scared little bitch. And I've like been analyzing my past a lot. And I think you should do analyze your past a lot. I tell everyone this. Analyze your past, derive lessons from it, apply it to your new. And when I say past, like not everything. Like me, my the biggest thing I've ever accomplished in my young life was freestyle skiing. Like I had sponsors, I was in films, like I, I just that was the thing I was good at. And I've derived lessons and this is a film about freestyle skiing. Oh, that's the one. That's the one. About that. Yeah, I've told yeah, you about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So what I've understood is that um, I was in freestyle skiing always a bit of a bitch. I was always like coward. Like I would just analyze the trick and not do it and not do it. But eventually I'd understand all the technicalities of it and then I'd go on it and I just, I became a super technical freestyle skier because um, I had this cautious approach. But this cautious approach of not doing anything, which is kind of what I'm doing right now, not really jumping into it. I'm kind of procrastinating like and I a, feel like a bitch for what I'm actually itself. doing is yeah exactly that's why i say study your past because everything that makes you behave in a certain way you did it in the past you analyze it you understand it you understand it for now um but everything in my behavior like that me being a bitch me not doing the trick was just more time to visualize and understand all the complexities of the trick right and then i'd actually do the trick i never fail well i did like in really complicated tricks but like all the big ones that scared me I never, I, I never felt like I always got a first try. Um, and that's kind of, I've been noticing that's been my approach in, in filmmaking. I'm like, wait, this, this film really scares the shit out of me. It's intimidating as fuck. It's like a really big jump that I can't attack, right? It's huge. And I'm like, oh, how do I do this job? But what I'm doing by not doing anything is actually doing something. What I'm, when I'm not doing anything, I'm analyzing all of the risks and potential failures of writing this scenario. Yeah. And when I feel confident or frustrated enough to actually get started doing it, I'm going to nail it because yeah. I'm going to understand so many yeah. things of it because I'm going to have spent so much time obsessing over it. So that's okay. kind of like, that's what I've been sort of understanding. And I feel like less depressed about my laziness because I don't, I don't qualify it as laziness anymore. I don't. Yeah. That's, that's a very multifaceted thing you just said there. <laughs> it's true because... Yeah. Uh, I'm like a multifaceted I, person. I, <laughs> I attribute it to like yeah, a lot of things, but the a really fascinating thing is the that that that's really cra- the craziest thing to me is because I'm not the biggest proponent of people can change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at all, <laughs> and uh, and that's really funny that the pattern that you found in skiing echoes itself years later in something completely different. You're doing the same thing, but, but that takes an analysis to back, know that. Can I go back? Can I go back to the? Can I go back to the cellular level? You're gonna go back to the cellular. I'm gonna go level? back to the cellular. Level. There I go. Because here's the Get thing. Get me with the cells. So <laughs> here's the thing. Fuck, do they have to do with this? <laughs> Everything. Here's the thing. The cellular level, our cells replace each other over a period of seven years. Our um, neural pathways do not change. Our neural pathways remain consistent until we're until we're hit by something like Alzheimer's or something like that. So basically, your thought process, whatever makes you, um, like your 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 patterns of thinking, your ways of analyzing things, those pathways, the ones that you keep using, remain there. So the patterns that you notice and how like you. Uh, face a scary jump they're the same but something about you pers- sorry, personality wise and all these things is different on a cellular level in terms of the things that you like the, all yeah, of that yeah, yeah. but you're, in terms of your direct responses as a person like how impulsive you are how like more of the change, more of like the monkey brain or lizard brain like more of the raw like reactions to things uh, doesn't change because yeah. your pathways are, are just stronger over time. Yeah, that that's I, I guess that is the cellular, cellular ex, uh, explanation yeah. as to why we don't necessarily change. Because I've been the, a proponent of the fact that we can only change. That's a strong position that you have. I want I want to know what you think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, how we can't change your. I don't. I know. I don't have <laughs> pessimistic. Well, yeah. about change. About change. Well, yeah, but maybe it's not. But the human pessimistic, though maybe it's actually optimistic because okay. maybe what I'm arguing for is look, you're not gonna morph into Dwayne Johnson <laughs> if you're, you know what I mean? If yeah. you're by the time you're 
twenty whatever five or whatever. Well, by the time it's you're, you're you know you're set. not gonna change. Yeah. You're not gonna change from the guy you are now, looking to be Dwayne Johnson. I mean, maybe that's then maybe that is pessimistic, mm -hmm. but I think you should operate to the greatest of your capacities knowing who the fuck you are which is the hardest thing to know but once you get a what about really, you is good what about you exactly is bad, like like how optimize. do i because like it, it's basically like okay look i i kind of get a sense of what car i'm driving on this highway and i'm not the ferrari there but there's ways that i can keep up with it there's ways that within the the confines of this vehicle that i've been given yeah i can fill it with more gas yeah i yeah. can maybe tweak a couple things under the hood, but I can't radically change it to the point, I can't radically change the horsepower of it, you know? That's an interesting metaphor that I like. Yeah. Yeah, so so instead of being the Ferrari, you can maybe be like more of an off-road model, and you're gonna be really good in the woods, but don't go on a racetrack. Like, exactly. You're not equipped for that. And that's you can the same as saying, that's, yeah, like, that's like, the same as saying no, no thigh limitations, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know why I old Englished it, but whatever, like, it's, <laughs> it's like. I like old timeliness, so I'm a big fan of it. No, know your limitations, that's what I think it is, and I think you can then progress from there, but totally. if you're trying to be the other ones that you simply can't be, then that's gonna, well, that's gonna hold you well, back. That's, well, that's, that's my perspective Well, that's 100% the thing, and, and the thing is, uh, this phenomenon that I observed in myself, this procrastination, is is well i'm not going to be dwayne johnson doing shit early morning like i procrastinate why do i procrastinate is it bad why is it bad is it good why is it good and then i've analyzed it and i'm like i proca pro procrastinate but i always nail it like i was like i would procrastinate homework until the day before and then i just fucking storm it out like flat one shot yeah. and then just get really good grades i didn't study i didn't do anything that's that's i was the annoying guy that didn't do any work and then the last second just nailed it. Yeah. Uh, well, that's my process. It's not. But that's it's not you're, bad. you're calling it procrastination, that's my process. but that's your process. Yeah, exactly. If my process isn't procrastination, my process is not liking the thing I have to do enough that I think about it and I put it in the back of my mind and I think about it and I analyze it and I'm like, why is this fucking thing? And then, and then I've thought about it for long enough that when I have to get to it, I just like. I just punch it I, up. I, I'm actually very similar to that, and I think the way that my thing works, it's not as thought out, and it's not, it doesn't go back years into my snowboarding as, yeah. <laughs> as, as yours does, but yeah. I think like the, the way I'll do it is when I, when I have to do a task, because sometimes it happens that I gotta do a task that I, I don't hold to heart, really, yeah, it's not, yeah, I'm not yeah. super passionate about, hard. I'll procrastinate the shit out of it, and yeah. like that is true procrastination, what I'm doing, but That's the right. thing is what I kind of do is I'll procrastinate to the point where it's almost basically fucking myself to have to do it. Because yeah. I think what I have but to do... But then adrenaline kind of kicks in. That's the thing. Like, you, yeah. it, it's a bit like editing too in a way because I have to feel the urgency yeah. in order to execute it. So like sometimes Same. when I know something three months in advance, I'm like, yeah, but I can't do anything now because that palpitating sense there. of urgency is not there yeah. and it's not going to have me perform. And I think that's why I'm, I'm totally. quite good on set with... Uh, problems and stuff. I won't yeah. really freak out and all that because I'm. You're, in, yeah, I'm you're in very much. A, yeah, that's very much one of your strengths. Yeah, and very cool about. Yeah, the like problems. calm in the storm yeah. of the thing because I'm so, I'm at home there first of all, like on sets and stuff, and also I'm kind of at home when I have that sense of urgency totally. because to me it's not this foreign thing that takes over my mind. Well, it's actually thing, my ally. Well, the thing that you like is the fighting, right? And the thing that I like yeah. is extreme sports. Yeah. So it, we're we're the same. And it's weird because, like I said, like I like to find people who I align with to yeah. work with. Yeah. Um, and it often happens to be people who have this like extreme, like the the same work dynamic we just described here. Yeah. The same thing. Yeah. Because like to me, it's just I need that really like high intensity. Like I'm addicted to adrenaline. Like I've kind of noticed when I finish a film, I'm like. I've noticed like I'm 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 I got the blues for like a month after, where I'm really? like I'm unpleasant I'm boring I'm like uh, I'm just grouchy like, and then I'm like oh that's a problem like why do I got the blues well I get a shit ton of adrenaline by being on set and calling shots so you shot your load kind of thing what like it's like <laughs> metaphorically well, you shot your load and you're offline for a month yeah well it's like it's. It's like the it's like getting injured skiing and then having a month off. It's like, well, I'd rather be skiing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. where, uh, why yeah, am yeah, I stuck yeah. here doing nothing? It's depressing. So it's just like I've got a big down from getting a big high, right? So yeah. I've, but it's crazy because I've actually, again, I always say analyze your past. 
Um, what I've understood from, and this, there's so much love going into this freaking skiing film that I want to capture, but because I've understood so many lessons. But one of the things that I've understood is that I've been waiting to get obsessed with filmmaking for the longest time. I dropped my sponsors like, fuck, I have no recollection of time, maybe five or seven years ago, I don't know, a while ago. Um, because I wanted to have a filmmaking career because I was yeah, like, yeah, you know yeah. what? Like I've seen friends almost die. Like I, this, the retirement plan is blow out your knee and then work as a low level representative for a skiing company. Like I don't want that. I, yeah, yeah, I want to yeah. have my filmmaking career and I'd been waiting to be obsessed with it and it didn't happen for the longest time. But recently I noticed my blues. I noticed like I just made a film and now I got the blues and I'm like, well, this is adrenaline. Like, I was feeling really high when I was making this film. And I'm like, oh, and I became obsessed with it. Like, in the last, I'd say, since I did O Jesus, I, I pretty much, attr actually, Unlocked was kind of the start. And then O Jesus was, like, full-blown confirmation. Unlocked made me realize this phenomenon. O Jesus confirmed it. Yeah. And then since then, I've just been sprinting. Yeah, I, well, I remember you were saying on Unlocked that it was, like, this was this is my first short film. In, yeah, my first well, serious. Or first, gonna, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I guess like yeah, CJ doesn't really count. This this is probably like my first short film, I'd say oh, after yeah, CJ, which was snowboard, skiing. Yeah, it was a um, competition like a skier plus a snow uh, plus yeah. a filmmaker. You know, it's funny, man. Like uh, the the one I'm writing right now, which like I don't, I'm not gonna get into it too too much because I'm very preliminary. But it's yeah. it's an allegory, and the whole thing takes place. It, it's kind of in keeping with my highway metaphor yeah. the whole thing takes place in a car that's on the highway yeah. and it's a lot of characters in it because um whatever yeah but uh yeah it's all on this metaphorical highway road and uh, i love the metaphors possible with roads yeah I yeah it. it's not it's not like um, a metaphor for you know the highway of life yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of thing but it's it's about the dynamics of what happens inside the car because mm -hmm. there's like kind of a hierarchy that forms and there's like mm -hmm. this a lot of weird shit going on but uh yeah it's it's all about it's all within a car and uh it's all allegorical so i'm kind of like living in that realm right now mm -hmm. and uh yeah i don't really have a process really no like i don't have well then again i don't i don't know how far well, you're probably early stages where you're you're crunching out ideas or are you writing your scenario no no, no. Or right. or I'm, I'm not writing the actual script in screenplay form that's like the very okay. last thing i do the first thing i do is just write scene by scene you just not not even what happens. it's just a story like okay. so so like i because when i was a kid i would fill binders of of uh of uh cool. like not the uh, cool. uh full of stories like i would just i was like a copious writer Shit. and it was probably like uh you know if i were to open one now it's fucking ridiculous <laughs> but like uh i would so I, that's kind of what i do because i like just starting to write a story as if you're just like just you know in the as board. you're like one of the characters and you see where the story brings you kind of right? kind of exactly yeah. exactly and then you know like i'll write a whole paragraph and like come back to it the next angle like no it's ridiculous but it's story form so it's mm -hmm. not uh formatted in screenplay form and i'm not kind of putting scenes as blocks and yeah. then see it's just story form and it, then you're going to see how you structure it exactly and you're going to go back. exactly i like that like working finishing you, touch you're basically working very large and then yeah. refining you're doing a sculpture and you're cutting out big shapes and then yeah, you, you were refining exactly, it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'm like halfway through and it's like a solid halfway through with the mm -hmm. fat cut out, not all of it, but like with a lot of the fat cut out yeah. so that the last step is formatting it. But what I like, the the kind of philosophy that I follow for writing it in this form here is as if you're telling the story to a dude at the bar. Because like, like I that. think the way that like, you know, well, the, the, the parts of the story that you choose to say are so different if you're telling it to a dude at a bar yeah. versus... Another. But but like when you're telling it to a dude at a bar or wherever, when yeah. you're just verbally telling a story, you're gonna make it cinematic because you got to hold their attention. So you're gonna you're gonna start kind of like how a movie starts with what we're talking about there. You're gonna start with a mysterious bit at the beginning, just a catch, and then yeah. So like w basically, what I'm gonna say is like you'll never guess who I f <laughs> I ran into a guy today yeah. who or no you you'll, you'll you'll start your story with something like. Um, like, you'll never, you guess what happened never to me. believe what the fuck happened today. Yeah. This guy that I knew, there's this guy that I was friends with eight years ago. And then, so you, you just by doing that, you get when oh, something crazy happened yeah. today, but I got to take you back eight years. And then now the guy's like, well, we're going to come back to the thing that happened today, but first I got to go through the, he's going to mm -hmm. put me back in context. And now you've got the, you got the guy leaning in, you know? 
And so like that's kind of like how I like. That's an interesting approach to your structure. Yeah, like it's, to, it's really not a structure that I well, carefully it, I've written down. No, but, it, but it's, it's probably a very common structure, what you're gonna get to, but your process so. is yeah. interesting. Like your process is how would I tell this in a bar? Which I yeah. love, is, and it's like, because there's something powerful about how you tell stories in a bar. Yeah, it's well because I, 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 like the, the first, or you know, one of the top, like one of the top three like criteria for when you're verbally telling a story to somebody is one of the first ones is holding the attention. Okay. And you do it's that one, by two, using three. cinematic techniques that keep you in the seat. Yeah. So that's kind of what I like doing. Because I also just like telling stories and trying to captivate yeah. people yeah. with the language. Because I think like, if the devices you're using, I'm telling you, are cinematic devices, which you can translate when you're putting it back in script form. Yeah. So yeah, right now it's just well, like flow, like flow of consciousness, whatever you call mm -hmm. that, just kind of story form. Yeah. And then you make people read that, and then they chip away at some of the fat people you trust, and then after that, mm. you siphon it down to the cinematic form of the screenplay. I yeah. think is like a cool way of doing it. It's a good but process. But it's a short the thing I'm doing, yeah. not a feature. It's a good process. The, the feature is just so intimidating to me. <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's I mean, a big thing, and it's like, why it's intimidating to me is because I have this thing that is just so important to me, and I want to get it so right, and there's so many elements that I want to fit in, that yeah. how do I make this like how do I give this story how do I honor this story as much as I think it deserves like my yeah. respect and like how do I I need to nail this and that's why like I've, I've got a huge document just strategic approach I've, I've started speaking to a couple producers and one guy was like shit like you're super strategic I'm like yeah that's, that's what I do and it's like I obsess over every single detail but yeah um I've been, one of the things that worries me, like, about starting this film is I've noticed how um, most of these good filmmakers, or the potentially good filmmakers, we will never notice um, because they had budgetary limitations or they had distribution limitations. Uh, just something that made it that they didn't succeed even though they had a really good core idea but they couldn't execute because they didn't have the money or because they didn't have the, the right contacts or something. It's so highly technical of a field that I think you can't overlook it, and I think you can't just be like, oh, well, the story is the most important thing, right? It is. It's the most important thing. But without all of this stuff, all the boring shit, the distribution, the financing, the product oh, placement, yeah. all of this shit, you're not going to be able to live up to the story you're trying to make. Either that or you will, and it's going to be amazing, but no one's going to see it. But maybe this one doesn't need to be your next one. This is the, no, no. This is the first film I'm gonna make, and it's I'm I'm probably it's very accessible. I have a lot of industry contacts. I have oh, so this if you film can is secure, fucking yeah. doable. I've just been analyzing all of the angles, all of the things I need to get right, so that I can get the story across to the broadest uh, target demographic possible. And I feel like I have it now. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I need to do is I need to find comedians, uh, and then get a scenario going, and then it's it's off to the press, man. And that's, that's it's an intimidating I, I, prospect. I was uh, I'm doing it. <laughs> so like one of my good friends from from my time in New York. Yeah. Right after he like he moved back to Eastern Thailand, and he I saw him go through the feature process. And he's going through it right now. He's mm. got one lined up, his second one. Crazy. But I was because I was on the the feature shoot, and it was like a New York Thailand based film, and I saw him go through that, and the producers and everything, because it was a small like kind of tight knit mm. crew. And uh, I saw them go through that, and it, it yeah, it is a monumental, crazy thing. Undertaking. I I wish I had. I, I want to see someone go through it because that's the thing is I'm such an outsider in this goddamn industry. It's like I'm coming out of nowhere, and I'm like not. I didn't do university. I didn't uh, like. I don't know all the classics. I've sort of got my own kind of flavor to it, and it's like I and I don't know the industry very well. I've just been like a freelancer, and yeah, yeah. I really feel like an outsider trying to understand this, um, but I think that's also my strength. Uh, exactly. That's yeah, because it makes me a very. It makes it gives me like a unique perspective, a I unique think so. voice kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. No, I think so. I think I think if you, like the more you inform yourself, I, I think it's a common thing to think that you're not ready for the next thing whenever Everyone you're at the cusp of it. Everyone Even when they're in the role, they feel like they shouldn't yeah. be in the role. Exactly. That's so 100 I think there's like you're you're ready. Yeah. Like 
given the stuff you've That's done, my the years of, of grinding, yeah. you're ready for it. You just you just need to like pretty much at this point take the still uh, to take the jump. I think yeah. the more you inform yourself with quote unquote the classics, yeah. like that might not necessarily be the greatest thing for you. Yeah, you know, like I don't think that's like. Because I, I had a friend who thought that too about himself. He was like, I haven't seen all the Hitchcocks. And the, that, what does he that make felt me, right? A no yeah. cute TV, you know? Yeah, and I'm yeah. just like, yeah, but dude, like, that's not necessarily your main. You're a dope DP. Yeah. So why yeah, yeah, does yeah, that yeah. really why matter? Why? Just keep doing your thing yeah. and then acquire things that your tastes allow you. Like, your tastes are going to make you gravitate towards exactly. the tools that you're going to take with you in your golf bag. I think, like, you should just like you know what I mean like yeah. to feel inadequate because you haven't seen North by That's Northwest. The, yeah. It doesn't matter, man. Totally. Like, you know what I mean? I, yeah, totally. It's weird. Like I, I get the same. What I feel like is I'm bringing a whole lot of just instead of bringing a shit ton of film language and film history and film knowledge into my film, I'm bringing all my other interests into yeah. my films. And do I have a strong enough grasp of the film language? I do. I, I, I can I, so. I can say this from like uh, I'm very analytical like I, I don't like like I suppose I need my complimenty like I know objectively I have a fairly good understanding of film language yeah um, so once you have that like just bring all the other stuff you have into it and and sure you're gonna make some mistakes but there's happy little accidents as Bob Rod. Bob Ross would say, right? They oh, sort of become like a bit of your style, right? You know, going so, back to my cool. teacher Till, the guy that uh, yeah. my my uh, German teacher, yeah. my uh, the mystical my, one. Uh, what is it called? A man of few words. <laughs> he the another thing he would say yeah. all the time was, he gets it or she gets it. Oh, I love and that. And it was I knew exactly. He never defined what that. But meant. you knew what it meant. But like I knew what it meant, and it, it basically yeah. meant it means what we said to each other yeah. uh, like a couple minutes ago, which was. That first time that film language clicked, Spoke the first time you. you got it, yeah. and that's what he meant. And it's, in film school, there was a lot. A of, there were a lot of people in my couple years in there that I would, you know, I would see when that was in my mind. Tills the uh, he yeah, or she he gets, gets it, it yeah. but they don't get it. I would see it in the filmmaking because they'd be kind of like, um, you know, we all worked on each other's films, and when it came time to do thesis films you would crew on your classmates' films. Yeah, yeah. And you would see which ones get it and which ones don't. Totally. And a lot of them were highly, highly, highly organized. They had a binder, a production packet binder, yeah, with yeah. all the right in These guys work those. well, like yeah, yeah. hard workers. And it was an artistically done production package, and it yeah. was great. But then when it came time to Good think bit. on set, they were like, oh, what does my binder say? And then you go, oh, she doesn't get it. That's good. And it's about <laughs> that cool. click. It's yeah. about that click of getting film language and the set and how shooting on set for an edit. You know, like it's all that, all those elements there, which uh, comprise the term gets it. Yeah. And I think totally that, that like you're. I, I get it. <laughs> get what you're saying. No, you do. I do. Well, I get what I'm saying, but you I also get, get it. I know I, you do. I feel like I do. <laughs> that, that's the biggest reason yeah. why I thought it was a great idea to have you on that camera for that yeah. for that shoot because I was like if anybody you knew I'd understand my position yeah but right. I also knew that you would like add to the position because you get it because mm. you know what we're going for because yeah. you, you, like you know I briefly explained like okay it's going to be this it's a reality whatever and we're going for these elements and I gave you just a couple of things because I knew you were just going to run with it and you know we I I know I'm going to find things in subsequent episodes and in the first one I, I saw the first one I was like I see what he did there I see what he created oh, and it's cool. because I knew that you would be the guy who would add the most to that role cool, man. and the other guys did their thing with their, yeah, their yeah. role they, you know, in like, their role yeah, yeah they, like the, 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 the ground guys did these really they, they came up with a really cool aesthetic mm. um, but yeah it's about getting it and because yeah. you were kind of a cog in that production wheel totally. but you knew exactly even though you were peripheral to even the pre-production things I knew that you got the style and yeah. that you were going to add a lot to it because of your understanding of the film language mm. so that that was a super important term man yeah. like uh, getting it that from him, totally getting it yeah. yeah that's a cool one yeah man there's so it's it's a language and um, like I, I literally compare film language to like French or English or programming languages like C++ yeah. like all this shit it's there's a translation process where having a close up with a shallow or deep depth of field means something 
or every single choice you make, something in the background, not in the background, something isolated against the color, lights in the back moving. Yeah. There's so many goddamn factors you have to contend with. Um, they all tell this story, but they are the words to the story. On top of the yeah, actors yeah, yeah. saying things, mm -hmm. they are the words in the story, and when he says she gets it or he gets it, well, it's that these people understand the words, like they, they get the language, and it's, it's a it. long process. I've started, I find it's, yeah. watching films now is super interesting because I notice so many new different little details that weren't noticed before, and I find that's where the masters have fun, right? Yeah. Most of the story gets told in the obvious choices, but where the masters really shine it's is all those level. little details. Oh, yeah. Really cool, interesting yeah. shit, man. But also, but also at the subtextual level, like yeah. of like what is not being said. That's like a lot of times where yeah. great actors, especially, mm. shine because oh, yeah. what we say to each other as human yeah. beings is kind of five percent of what we're actually meaning, yeah. and like what we actually mean is the weight of the le non dit, you know? Yeah. And, One of my and favorite actors. If you actors. could act, if you could, who is it? Yeah. Well, well, that I work with. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of his things that he does is he just revises my stuff and just takes out words. I'm like, yeah. It's awesome. It's yeah. the best. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, this would be better with like a face. Like, do it. <laughs> it's yeah. Great. If you can act towards, if you're acting the subtext, yeah. the dialogue, most of the time, I, this is my contention, most of the time you can watch a movie on mute, which I, 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 I used to do that a lot back That's when I was like in my, yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, I would do, I would do that a lot, like way too much. It's a great way to analyze. Well, because... You're eliminating all those sound all design. Those do, that, that's a hugely immersive oh, part yeah. of the equation. If if anything, it, it might be one of the most immersive things. It's the most so overlooked. You take it's that the out. one that people don't notice. It's the one yeah. that they don't notice that it's there, but it has a huge effect on them. So if you huge. mute it, you're muting out like a huge yeah. part of what's immersive about a film. Mm. And now, try watching anything on mute. You're gonna start seeing the patterns. You're gonna start seeing. Oh, they cut to that shot quite a bit. Like they. Oh, you know what? They're, they're, they seem to frame a lot below the eye. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's gonna all come oh, to the forefront. Right. And I used to do a lot too much of that when I was a crazy film student. Very smart. And going home and just ah, I'm gonna do everything on mute. Well, that's, the that's, teacher told me that to that's do probably that. why you were you were one of the best in your year too, right? I remember you. I remember hearing about you through a couple people, and uh, yeah. you were. I mean, I took it seriously. Like, I took, you it, took it, seriously. it seriously. There was always a when I say the best people, there was always a couple people who took. Seriously, yeah, right? Yeah. And, uh, and it's the people, people who get it. That's who get close it, exactly. to the top. That's who close to the top. I remember there was, in my year, we were four people, maybe, who got it. Yeah, out of 50, 50 I don't even know. It's, yeah, a very large amount. Yeah. It's kind of depressing. But, it's, uh, but that, there's another element there, which is like also, you know, more than half the people who were in our years, like that's not, not what they even wanted yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah so course. there's like that. Yeah. But yeah, what were you saying about uh, just before that? Uh, the Irish potato famine, how it really sucked. And <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I'm here, man. Because like, you're a little Irish. Yeah. No, I'm full yeah. On you're full on. Uh, of course. Yeah. yeah. McNamara is pretty goddamn Irish. Well, it's like fifty percent. Like my dad's lineage. Is you're uh, you're probably no, actually, guys Irish are pretty buff usually. Because most of the Irish really? people They're I know are like small, like lightweights. Because you know the Irish potato famine really sucked for them. And, yeah, they uh, shrunk us. Yeah, shrunk us new, good, dude. <laughs> Lots of nutrition uh, deficiency. This is now the second episode in the row where we talk about the Irish potato famine. Get really? used to it. <laughs> Why'd you delve into that the last time? I always do. It's my go-to whenever it gets awkward. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, this is going to be the most awful uh, segue. Uh, segue. But speaking of the Irish potato famine and the randomness of... Uh, I wanted to talk about the thing that's going on right now in my life around me. Um, and the film alluded to it, uh, how their that conclusion, film? yeah, their conclusion in the, well, not their conclusion, but one of the narrators said, like, he was smoking a cigarette, and he's like, yeah, like, I'm numb to it all right now, because, like, what I've realized is that it's random. You can be the best soldier in the world, you can be just super trained, but a bullet just fucking whips at you because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. That, that randomness of life, I find his, uh, that character, that line to me hit me really hard. Because uh, I've got like one of my really like one of my best friends, the girl who was on the podcast yeah. last time, just got in a really gnarly kite surfing accident, like really gnarly. She um, she just she was kite surfing, and she she's out on the waves like every day, and some guy's kite got tangled up in hers because he's a noob. Uh, 
Yeah. And she got thrown up into the rocks and broke her, like her femur went up to her pelvis. And it's gnarly as hell, man. It's like she's, she got airlifted out uh, yesterday at two in the morning. Wait a minute. It's gnarly. <laughs> yeah. Is there a GoFundMe? Yeah, that you might have seen it go around. Oh yeah, there. So that's she's, crazy. It's Amanda nuts. was just looking. She knows this she, girl. Then. Well, she, this girl knows a lot of people. Yeah. She's, um, yeah, it's fucking gnarly. She's her family's probably going to be like sixty thousand bucks in debt, but the GoFundMe is doing yeah, killer. yeah. It was like at like fifty thousand. I was so impressed by it. Yeah. Um, but basically, the insurance wouldn't cover it for reasons that I can't wait to find out because I hate insurance companies. Ooh, um, man, that's but. A, 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 yeah, man, like, it was so random, like, she, so she's, like, it was life-threatening, I don't know if it still is, it potentially is, I need to go to the hospital and see her, but, like... So she's back here? She's back here, she where, got where flown was... in Dominican Republic, she got flown uh, back to Canada yesterday at 2 a.m., she had an how operation... How did they already, how did the insurance there? company already come up with the... The estimate, well, the, the hospital that was treating her probably came up with the estimate of... No, not like the estimate, that. but the, uh, like, the, like... How, like how she's not going to be covered like that so I have to investigate that or something no man I don't know I hate insurance companies and I assume the worst because they tend to be the worst um, but what I think is maybe the case and this is not confirmed uh, is probably an extreme sports clause and they don't tell you that when you're yeah, when you're, sense, yeah. they just avoid that conversation and then you're in it and, you're, and they fuck you every chance kite surfing thing, is considered extreme sports because yeah. you'd have to see if it falls it is it, it, there are a lot of dangers in kite surfing um, but the thing is, like, I hate insurance companies because they used to be there to assure, like, risk, right? They used to be there, like, here's a risk, we're going to insure it so that you can go out there and do it. Insurance companies started off by, like, sending boats across seas, right? They would f insure the shipment. Like, so let's say they traded corn with, like, gold or something. They would insure the ship of, of corn so that if it crashed, they'd be able to pay the ship owners the amount of money and they wouldn't be financially wrecked and they would be able to assume the risk of going on these huge endeavors. So right? noble causes. Noble causes. And risky causes. That was the point of insurance companies. But now yeah. insurance companies, they evaluate the risk to everything. They, they, I mean, they know the risk factor to almost every single human activity to like a percentage point and they know exactly how much money they should charge every single individual to be able to get uh, financial like you know something mm. that makes sense financially and the thing is that the idea of a financial company is that uh, an insurance company should be that you assume the risk of the highly risky stuff with all of the over all of the money you make from all the less risky stuff so that you can invest in the risky stuff because that's the stuff that like you need insurance for yeah yeah, yeah. But they, they don't do it they, they just any clause they can to refuse you they're like no so I don't know if it's that if that's the case, but if it's not, here's a random tangent about how much I hate insurance companies, because um, like I'm an extreme sports guy, like I, right. and I've seen like I've seen one of my friends break his neck and like almost die, like, and now my friend like Julie just fucking banged up against the rocks, and I'm like, again the insurance companies are a bitch, and uh, yeah, so but the randomness of life, right? That's what this guy it's, does, huh? That's he, what the whole thing is about, right? He's like auto insurance. Like, he'll go and evaluate a car crash, but with a bent for the auto company. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, I thought I think that's what that is. That's one of the films that captured that process the best. Yeah. He, he shows up at a, um, it's like, I think it's a burn victim inside a car. Yeah. And he, he's like, oh, look at the fat, like, stuck on the tissue. He doesn't give a fuck anymore. He's like, ah, the thing about the insurance company. Yeah. And he just lays it out for you, and you're like, Ugh. Yeah, this is a he, gross thing. <laughs> he, he, he basically concocts a reason as to yeah. why it the why fault not is not on the, and that seems to be that's the kind. Of, yeah, it, it's kind Which, of turned into a kind of selfish, yeah. you know, for selfish means kind of. The thing is, like, I want these companies to make ridiculous amount of monies because they do a really good public good service. They ensure people do not go through really shitty situations, so they should for offering such a beneficial service, make ridiculous amounts of money. I, I'm a money guy. I don't have a problem with people making ridiculous amounts of money. But the thing is, when that balance is not good anymore, and the cases where you should be paying out, um, because now you're ruining lives, because these people thought they were insured, but they're not, because you have all these stupid clauses and you don't assume any risk anymore, 
fuck you. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, well, I'm like one of those cases. I think again, I'm not 100 percent sure if it's an if it's an extreme sports clause, but but the thing like it's been weird like the that whole randomness because like I'm addicted to adrenaline like I've been skiing like my whole life I've been skateboarding like yeah. even now I got a bike and I drive like an idiot like I, I'll just get like 100 percent all the time, um, and I've always gotten away with it, but then every once in a while like shit the randomness of life hits you it's not she wasn't doing like crazy shit right mm-hmm. it's just bam randomness yeah, I mean I, I hope how do you deal with the randomness of life do you like what's your I've opinion? never been in a situation really where it's struck me yeah that you know what I mean never. like there's never been like a kind of a rip tide type unfortunate yeah. situation that's you like haven't had it affected so close and I yeah. fucking hope I don't yeah. maybe like I guess there are, like, a couple times I, yeah, I could have kind of doing extreme shit. I used to be, I used to bike in New York all the time, which is its own jungle. It's got its own. <laughs> yeah. I was a biker in New York for, like, four years. Oh, shit. And I would kind of whip around everywhere. And because you do that, and I was, you know, kind of fit and, like, I would want to yeah. go fast and yeah. whatever. You also, in biking in New York, you get into this, it's its, its own universe because no laws apply to you. You're yeah. a pedestrian and a vehicle at all times whenever you want to be. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I was, you know, and so at one point I got fucked up. Like, I, I got hit uh, by a cab, yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> by a yellow yeah. cab. Oh, it was just some, some, some girl, some, some woman, I guess, like, just flung her door open on Fifth uh, Avenue as I was, yeah. like, bombing down. That's the way too fast. Like, for sure, <laughs> way too fast. And I just went, I went flying. Yeah. I went flying and, like, I kind of fucked up my shoulder, but I was, like, somehow magically okay mm. so that was kind of the randomness randomness of like working it's a in... certain degree of randomness but you're pushing yeah. it right yeah, yeah same thing like she was kite surfing but it's a really banal thing like most of the injuries i've had skiing were really banal like not in the heat of the yeah, gym it wasn't a crazy huge trick. jump I, yeah you know and um but my the way i see the randomness of life like being a scary thing is like well it's random so fuck it then like I might as well just like push hard because like yeah. look at somebody can cross the street and somebody's in, like there's another person around me that I've heard about recently um, he was just doing his laundry and uh, there was like a drug thing and they just shot all witnesses guy got fucking murdered in a laundry what? in a schlager. oh no shit oh yeah so it's like fuck okay well if life is a random bitch then i, don't, I might yeah. as well charge hard and for uh, that for those kinds of crazy. stories i do not know in that and i guess that does lead into the film right like th- exactly. there's a that's what there's I, a, to me there's an even more poignant moment in the film that's pertinent to what you're saying which yeah. was at one point there's this guy this american dude looking down into the mud and there's a face kind of yeah almost completely yeah, uh, covered uh, yeah but it's just like you just you just see the face and it's a dead person and the voiceover comes from the perspective of the like the dead guy yeah. weirdly and it goes uh, like do you think that you're I'm, I'm completely yeah, yeah, yeah. paraphrasing the shit out of yeah. it but from what I got from it was like the it's like as if the dead guy is telling the guy who's alive standing over him full health and everything mm-hmm. goes uh, do you think that you're immune to this to, to death or do you think that you're immune to the randomness of life because mm-hmm you love because you yeah, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are in a good standing in your life yeah, the no, bullet doesn't no even talk not. about that yeah. and the bullet is I guess the, the randomness of life and that's kind of how I saw that yeah. that uh, that moment and yeah I don't know in that story that you just told me I don't know how to reconcile my good feelings about where I'm at in life yeah. with the unfairness of that randomness totally so I'm, yeah. I'm connecting the two I'm like shit's going good for me I've been working hard I gotta keep pushing because life is a random bitch yeah. so I should push hard because something random could hit me so I gotta do the most I can before something random hits me also pushing my luck but you know um, yeah. yeah it's a crazy thing I, I have a whole other thing though like because it's uh, coming back to like the insurance and all that yeah. stuff like I'm I'm really not like a the most responsible in life when it comes to like Same. paperwork yeah. and uh, keeping my affairs in order, you know, mm-hmm. and it's just because like I, I feel like uh, I mean, and you probably understand this. I think it's because we're passionate about what we do, yeah, and totally. in an artistic field, it kind of blinds you from the yeah. banal the stuff. The things that are impassionating, it's like eh, 
Yeah, no I, I really, stuff. I, I have a totally. hard time even just opening letters. Like when I get letter, like government stuff and bank stuff, I just look at them and I go, I just, just to me that is the the, the bane of my existence. Yeah. I, I can't yeah. deal with something that's not what I, and it's a huge fucking fallacy. <laughs> yeah. But I, my point of view on that is like a really kind of twisted one because I, I don't think that, I think we're, we've bogged ourselves down as like a, a race with, bureaucratic things yeah like I feel okay. like that sucks the bureaucracy is a very non-human thing I, yeah it's I a very so. non-human thing and, and, and <laughs> I, I have a theory on that and it's like I read this book kind of recently uh, Sapiens yeah did you read that uh, audio book so you listen because I it. don't read good I read good <laughs> but I just I'm too, too but you got through it's it? too slow yeah it's a great book that there's a there's a, a a part in that book that really fucking opened my eyes to everything and it's like one of those things you know when you read something like somebody put their finger on something you've always felt Just, but he put the right words to it and you're like yeah yes there's like a whole chapter yeah. it's 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 uh, the point where uh, he goes because I always thought that like agriculture like oh, the yeah. onset of agriculture it was the most eureka perfect yeah. moment right but and, and I thought that like well that's what brought we us all together ourself. exactly it's such a like Exactly, Whoa. and because around that we Jeez. built these gigantic civilizations, it became and, slave to the technology. Yeah, well, it, yeah. So the wheat yeah. gave way to technology, but we—that was the moment that we became dependent on a single thing. Yeah. And ever since then, we've been on this kind of—you can call it a downward spiral of dependence on other single things, and yeah. that's not a good model. It's not a good model at all. It, and, it depends and, on what you calculate it for, in terms of you know our passing on our genes it's the most effective model. yes That's yes fine fine, fine, fine. Yeah. but at the same time in terms of human happiness probably not. no yeah. yeah and that's that that's that's okay. kind of the barometer that i'm talking about yeah. but also the human happiness thing and the procreation thing kind of go hand in hand in my gripes with procreation hand in hand <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> no um it, it's because i don't believe that we should and maybe you, you agree or not like yeah. i, I I don't think that we should be living in these giant civilizations that we've shoved ourselves well, into. A lot of the evidence shows that we sh this shouldn't be happening. No, no. <laughs> I mean, we devolve into war every 30, 40 years. Okay, uh, that, that's one thing. The human, human groups have evolved to live on average in 60 people societies. Uh, now we're managing hundreds of thousands. So, so that's actually yeah. what I was going to get at <laughs> about, about the, like, yeah. the studies that show that I, the ones that I know of are were 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 conducted in chimp populations, yeah. but they There's so much good chimp science out there. Oh my god, man! Yeah. And one of them was the, a population size study, yeah. which I can't quote, but like you can find because like, they, they talk about yeah. it in safety. The ones. average po population size is sixty. Yeah. So so like yeah. So there's like a there's like a number out there, and I guess it's sixty. Yeah. That when you every individual above sixty. The correlation between the group happiness, every individual above that goes down an equal amount, and it's because there's a sweet spot in there that we, because yeah. I think with the chimps, it's like the number above like sixty or whatever it is, the number that they yeah. agreed on, uh, that's about as many individuals as you can claim Keep to track. know, exactly. yeah, personally. Yeah. So, like in a group of sixty, you have hunted with one. You've picked berries. Yeah. You've picked ticks out of each other's backs. Yeah. That is the amount that people are comfortable with. Above that, you actually weirdly fall back into loneliness Have, and problems yeah. with and anxiety. Yeah, and, and that's and a mental thing that, That's a thing that which are overwhelmingly present in these societies because yeah. we're way the fuck too big. Yeah. So have you, have you, so you're a South Shore guy and, uh, yeah, it's for that fucking reason. Man. I love South Shore guys. I cannot wait to be a South Shore guy. Here's my life mission right now is I cannot wait to make, to build up enough notoriety for myself so I can get the fuck out of the city, oh, go back man. on the shore and just come to Montreal for work. I cannot wait because now and I'm even that's negotiable for me. I don't want that. I don't want that. <laughs> well, the filmmaking industry is here, but, um, but the thing is, have you, like you take the Metro you feel the tension, right? People are all looking at each other. They don't look at each other. They look at each other like that. It's because we're humans. We we interpret social cues, right? And you can only man manage a certain amount of social cues. There's 60 people in the metro. You're not going to be able to analyze everyone's social cues. No. We're not, like, built yet for this many people. We can adapt to it 100%. 100%. We're adaptive and, animals. Evolution yeah. is a thing. Um, but how fucking long does that take? It does take a long time. Okay, so that that actually is like the bigger point, which is 
that in the book they mm. they say listen man like we have been nomadic for the longest so like, like it's like a, I think it's like a hundred or three hundred thousand years compared to like thirty exactly yeah. but also even longer than that though because our ancestors yeah, like Homo yeah, sapiens yeah, yeah, yeah. have been around for uh, yeah, you know, three hundred thousand okay fine the, the like findings. but we are part of a larger species okay. the Homo exactly. uh, species you're more and, Homo than I am because <laughs> <laughs> you're big you're parts. big I'm less yeah. Homo because. You know, it just I'm there's more, more of a homo, scrawny there's human. More homo. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> but uh, no, so like our species, because yeah. the thing is, like Homo sapiens is a part of. At, at one point, yeah. there was Homo erectus. Homo, yeah, yeah the exactly. Hominids. So yeah. there were there were a lot of us. The Homo sapiens are just the ones that won out because yeah. of various reasons, and yeah. like they talk about in the book. But so we have been nomadic for actually millions of years. Yeah, and so versus. 30,000 years of agriculture? Yeah. Is it's it something like, like that? It's 30,000, something like that? So, like, we have not actually fully adapted to... It's just that, like, the onset of agriculture forced us yeah. so rapidly to become sedentary. Yeah. But we were not ready for that, and we're still not. I find there's a lot of this, like... Um, right now, I find we're in a lot of, like, revisionist science. Like, a lot of these, like, social issues about, like, women's roles, men's roles, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we should be paying attention to women's roles, men's roles, and what we are, how we live in society. It's great that we have a conversation. But the thing is that a lot of these conversations are being done from a, hey, let's dismiss everything that's biology and evidence and reinvent stuff so that we can re... Yeah. Like, we can... We can so that we can reform people's behaviors. But, like, that's not how it works. Like, if you want to bring change you need to understand what the limitations are and you can't throw out the science i'm like i've been like very worried about people just bad science out there like intentionally throwing out evidence like vegetarians for example like yeah. oh my god yeah. um not all vegetarians i think i've got a lot of friends that are vegans. vegetarians vegans let's yeah. talk about vegans yeah v vegetarians don't tend to have this uh mindset but a lot of any I have vegan friends who like I'm fine with and I find their perspective is fine and I don't think it's a bad thing like I there's a good way to be vegan but some of them feel like they can only be vegan by uh, it being know what right doing. scientifically so they oh. lie about the teeth we have in our mouth and they say like oh no we're like we're not even omnivores like we didn't like you you're 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 lying or yeah, you're, you're, yeah. No, there's so much. Just the gut biome that we have has evolved to digest meat. Like you're wrong. These things are meant to cut up meat. Did you ever see these things on vegetarian animals? Like, no. There's just there's just yeah. There's a lot of these ideologies that are at a point right now where to fight to survive, a lot of the new science has been dismissing them, and they they're they're they have jobs they, they work in agencies a lot of them get government grants and shit mm -hmm. and for them to survive they've got to pretend the science is wrong yeah that pisses me off <laughs> that pisses me off because we're attacking science and the universities are all fucked right now like uh, i i'm getting like super pessimistic about all yeah. this stuff and there's a very big shift to stupidity instead of intelligence. But, but I also think that like like all this stuff that you're talking about creates like the the idea of like teams or factions oh, and yeah. stuff. And I think that if you're actually talking about like change is like a gigantic deterrent to that because we're bogged down at, at, at such a low level that we shouldn't be at. Yeah. Because like the shit that we're talking about in terms of like the human condition and everything yeah. is actually bogged down by this infighting, you know? It's yeah. like well, we don't get we don't get to talk to that really deep stuff. Exactly. We're stuck on the infighting on the upper level. That's what I'm saying. Stuff. That's what I'm saying. Agree. And like it's just like I don't know, people failing to actually kind of really understand each other, be on the same page to deal with stuff because we're kind of like you know, it's like second grade problems. Yeah. Like he shot the spitball with me or whatever. <laughs> where it's like, no, but we're supposed to be in like actual university level discussions yeah. about shit. Yeah. So that that's well, kind of that's why I've been doing like the podcast because the Joe, Joe Rogan's just been more huge awakening. Yeah, right? like yeah. Joe, like he's I have no shame in saying this guy is like huge inspiration for me because he made I argue he did make long format podcast a thing, right? They weren't a thing before he did. It. They they weren't a thing, but I will I will throw because I know this stuff because I I was a giant fan. I don't know, maybe you know them, but like back when I was in New York, I was super into uh, this show called Opie and Anthony. 
channel of, of them. They they were this uh, they were this radio show. They were oh, okay. terrestrial and later on on like satellite. They 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 would anyway whatever. They're they're considered shock jocks. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, they were just highly opinionated. No, no, sorry, not even highly opinionated. Mm -hmm. They were just they did kind of extreme shit. But basically, they became this hub for stand-up comedians and yeah, they would get yeah, yeah. they would have a lot of like guys who were huge now like Burr and Louis CK and you know Norton Jim Norton he yeah, was, like, a, he, was a, he was a co-host it was it was Opie Anthony and Jim Norton he was just <laughs> not on the marquee but it was those three dudes okay. and they had some of the greatest discussions I that that largely it was formed back then that yeah that largely formed the way I think That's because cool. they had guests like do you know Patrice O'Neill yeah Okay, well, so like that guy was on almost every single day, nice. and so I would just that like, guy was strongly opinionated. That guy was on another level of rationalization. He would not be on anything else. Yeah, yeah, like like a lot of the people who like really formed the way I thought, like of of the popular people who have not like yeah. teachers and stuff. Yeah, yeah was yeah. was George Carlin. Yeah, and Patrice O'Neill. Like those two huh. dudes were fucking huge for me. And Patrice, Tommy's, it was like in the hate it, and they would have they, their radio show was just fucking. It was like never. It was they had no format to it. It was yeah. just talking. They just did it until yeah. they were tired of doing it. Exactly, that's and they cool. had Rogan on as a guest multiple times. I feel like that's in. probably where he got the idea. It's where he says he got it. He says it. Yeah, cool. yeah. Because I, I Rogan's started, cool like that. He attributes credit where it's due. He's yeah, cool dude. yeah. Well, he had uh, he had he has Norton on a couple times, but he had the, yeah, uh, Greg Opie Hughes like of mm -hmm. Opie and Anthony. And at the, the top of the show, if you listen, like he said, like yeah, this I got That's this, cool. yeah, from them because they would just well, sit I in a room and fucking talk, and they were stand-up comedians. It was I think, hilarious yeah, shit. Exactly. I think. Man, that was. I think what we can attribute to Rogan though is that he popularized it. Definitely, yeah, like, because they were, yeah, yeah no one. They yeah. were niche, and and now it's and it's not just him. And it was radio too. exactly. And the thing is that Rogan is part of a YouTube movement. Like the this is the internet stepping out of the wild west zone and yeah. starting to create industries and starting to become big and he's yeah. on top of he's riding that wave uh he's one of the first to stand up on the wave so like yeah um i attribute a lot to that but i think like but i just think that this is the ultimate format we've found like right now for in terms of we need a return to intelligence god damn it are people stupid uh um, yeah like i think and everyone will agree that people are stupid even stupid people like we all just like there's just like a but this is definitely popular, positive it's popular to avoid the hard subjects it's popular yeah, to yeah, not yeah. think and just you know act rash and and all this stuff but uh i think the long pot the long form podcast is kind of the antidote to that and what we need right now yeah. is we've got a lot of complex issues with global warming all these gender issues we've got complex issues we just we just need to have these in-depth conversations where we go yeah. into detail about them and where we remain rational and we uh, that's why I'm but doing I, the podcast. I think, I think in, in a lot of life, though, there is this like kind of circular oh, yeah. motion to a lot of things. There's always a return, Entry. and the way, the, like, uh, um, I think in, in in filmmaking, you can see that happening because filmmaking is just a thing that yeah. has trends to it. But I think it, tr it it transcends just filmmaking. It speaks of the way that we oh, approach yeah. things, which is at a certain time in society. Yeah, yeah, like like okay, so for example, like right now, we're at pretty much like the apex of like resolution and frame rates and you can oh, yeah. shoot oh, fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. 8k oh, yeah. 60 you know, there's no need to grow there anymore no like, exactly we have the <laughs> sharpest lenses in the world yeah. but then when we're at that apex what right are we after that, back to? there's a return to the old shit so at imperfect anamorphic shooting not necessarily or not just that, that the return to the story more and the return to yeah. the real like capturing really real ambiance yeah. and real moments like and, if you look yeah. at like yeah a lot of stuff a lot of music videos now we were, we're returning to like a kind of gritty handheld anamorphic look and it's kind of like stripping down yeah. the level that technically technically we've achieved with Ken. so I think in a lot of art there's always that you get to a certain point and then there's a rebellion against that point yeah. that you get to that is considered the apex, the you know creme of the you know like the the pinnacle of the craft. Yeah. So there's always then dissenters who so and and then it'll come fucking well, back around. It's uh, art you know? resembles life and life resembles art. Yeah. It's, it's very much the case. Yeah. So in the, like what were we talking about just before that example? The, it was uh, the well the podcasting. Yeah. About how there might now be a return towards intelligent programming because if you look at Netflix. All, like most people well, I, don't, I can't say that but a lot of people are you know binging Netflix yeah. programming yeah, yeah, yeah. and original Netflix programming and when you look at the quality that that's at man 
if you've spent any any spent any amount of time on Netflix, it's pretty high. It's it's really dude. It's, <laughs> it's not pro, it's not network television. So no. the pro the programming you're getting and yeah. the artistry with which it's made yeah. is really amazing. Yeah. All these series that I think like the, the production value yeah, and the intelligence of the writing and everything. It's and 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 a thing that's coming back now. Uh, that has been back for a while is uh, the documentary. Yeah. That is has become well, the, I, cool again. I, I call it sort of the renaissance of documentary. Netflix has been the renaissance oh, of documentary. 100%. And it's because, just so accessible. But because it's become, like, because it's Netflix, everyone has a fucking account, yeah. you're gonna at some point gravitate, there's amazing programming there. So if yeah. that becomes the norm, if that becomes how people are consuming yeah, most awesome of their media, thing then at least people are being subjected to really deep nuance. Like, yeah. man, a lot of yeah. the documentary stuff that I've watched on Netflix a is lot super of them, nuanced. A lot of them are absolute yeah. trash, though. A lot of them, like, you on just... On Netflix? Oh, yeah. It could like, be, maybe it's because it's the one like, I grabbed. For it. example, Cowspiracy. I'm sorry if you like Cowspiracy. Let's talk. Uh, how many goddamn awfully inaccurate facts did they espouse? Like... And they don't get a form where they get fact check, fact check, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So, but God damn it, am I happy that documentaries and being informed is a thing, right? Yeah. I mean, I the first thing that got me informed, I was into conspiracy theories in the beginning. That's what yeah, I was like. Me too. God, yes. that's what got me into information. Is that? And then I slowly disproved my positions. I hope that people will get to a so point. So you started as a conspiracy guy, and then one hundred percent. I got into me, politics. Man. Same shit, dude. Awesome man, because yeah. you're an internet kid, probably right. You, did, you, did you get the internet We're early? Like, uh, I yeah, same. I got the internet fairly early in my school. I was like, I think in my grade, I was probably the first because my mom worked at Seftsmaj and we, yeah. she had shares and like we I bought a computer and the internet. Not as early as you but I was like, as a kid, I remember being into forums and stuff, and I got into conspiracy theories, and then from conspiracy theories, aliens were my shtick. Uh, uh, from okay. there, I got into global politics. Well. If there are all these aliens, why is the government hiding it? Well, how does the government structure? How does it work? And then I, that curiosity got there, and then it eventually still, disproved my still, own yeah, position, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But it gained to me an, uh, an interest for politics, for geopolitics, so the world, like other governments, how they interact with each so other. You springboarded from totally. the conspiracy thing into totally. it. Yeah. It's, yes. uh, so it's, I hope people are going to make that step. Like a lot, like Cowspiracy. Please go to the cow facts. I'm actually like, curious. I, want to check that out. I don't want to give them a view. Though. There's just a shit ton of, well, go watch it. It's, they did a good job at the filmmaking and nice job at your propaganda. But there's a lot of, just look at the, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, counter facts, out, like uh, websites that break down all the issues specifically yeah. and do research into all the points that the films make. And it, they've got like a 10% accuracy in their claims. Like, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's kind it's of... responsibly made. Exactly. And like, I'm, I'm down for like, you know, let's lower our meat consumption. But here's my argument for the meat consumption. And I tell this to every vegan I always meet. It's like, do you know, like, instead of like shaming people and like, meat is good. Okay. I like, I like meat. You're not going to make me stop eating meat. So there's two options. Okay. First of all, convince me to meet, to eat once in a while, something other than meat so that you're going to lower my consumption. Like mushroom burgers. You ever had mushroom burgers? I have. Yes. They're so yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. They're so good. Uh, so convince me to do that, or here's the other thing, instead of spending like $100 more on your groceries every week, because it's, it's expensive to eat vegan, right, like all these like bio, bio ingredients and stuff, put like 20 bucks a month, invest it in these uh, lab-grown meat companies. Do you know about lab-grown meat? No. I think two years ago, they were at $300,000 a burger. They're at $18 <laughs> a burger now. $18. Wow. That means, they just, yeah, they take, uh, they take, uh, they take, they sell the so uh, oh, stem yeah. cells, yeah, yeah. and in a lab they grow meat without any torture, any problems, and they had it from three hundred thousand dollars a burger to eighteen. I think we're about three to five years maximum from having a commercially available lab-grown meat burger. This vegan thing is not an issue. Just invest in that. Make it happen in three years instead of five. Yeah, do it. I do mean, it. I, I would wait. Science for is the solution. Like, stop like, making everyone feel guilty. Fucking science it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would. I would wait for that to be more of like a thing that ha has been readily eaten by a lot of people. Because like, oh, okay. In terms of like the health. Yeah, because like then, 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 because what always happens is you like, you know, you go on your fucking internet browser and you see there's a new article oh, and it goes lab grown. 
Yeah, or, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. But, or, or it's true, like just lab grown yeah. meat it fucking kills you, it gives you a pancreatic cancer, and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, I've been eating it for Well, four the years, thing is, that, that's the result. I, I'm so, I'm zero into um, food science because I find it too that's, intimidating that's to get into because, the, exactly. It can also be a racket. Exactly. Because, because of lobbying groups and shit exactly. like that. Yeah, you because know. there's so many interest parties yeah. where yeah. you promote one thing, that's hurting this company's bottom line, that one, that one, that one, and they're all attacking. Yeah. So it's just so hard to navigate. It's, it's just yeah. It's, it's, and it depends crazy. what you're tackling too. You know, like uh, if you're tackling like uh, what like cause I, I saw this documentary. I don't remember what it was called, but it was like there were apparently all these studies done by the World Health Organization. I don't know, what it, but it was like this kind of World Health Body. Yeah. And they had written these uh, studies back in the '80s or '90s about sugar and about how it's horrible for you. Mm. And yeah. it was just about how sure, the big food fire. lobbyists destroyed all these studies so that they weren't yeah. really, really, really... Yeah, really they, uh, the government was uh, sort of blackmailed into destroying uh, any of any of the any of that yeah it's, that, that's yeah. that's what's fucked up uh, and they made fat illegal one of the things that I'm slowly starting to believe in in terms of food science because I just don't have enough attention for it uh, is the whole sugar thing um, because yeah. they outlawed fat like all the tra- like you remember we were at war against trans fat like in the uh, yeah. early 2000s so now it's sugar. I forget but <laughs> obesity Exactly, because that oh, was not, not yes, because, down. <laughs> because, for, because to go from less saturated fat foods, yeah, they poured more sugar into the fucking like foods, cardboard. and then, yeah, exactly. But to, to get again to go around that, if you're gonna take away the fat content from they the food, added sugar. they added sugar for the taste thing. Yeah. So it's like they, so then they can they could write low fat, yeah. But exactly. if you look, it's yeah. the sugar. So it's exactly. like they, the fat sugar. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's what was, the, and that's the real killer. That's the Okay. That's, a real That's what killer. people are noticing a lot. Like a lot of the science is starting to agree. And my mom's on a no sugar diet, and like, holy shit, they're in shape. My mom and her boyfriend, like, yeah, killing it. But it, I, I'm curious about the long term repercussions, though. But well, it depends. At least, at least very much sugars, obviously. Like you know, if you're all talking sugars. about well, it's hard to cut out all sugars. I know. It's very hard. That's why they don't get invited to stuff. What, what, <laughs> what I started, what I started doing a couple weeks ago, I couldn't because at one point I had a, a shoot that. Shoot, it's fucking hard to have this life and, and have it's, a strange and especially on shoots on like, set, it's impossible. Man. I know because you do the it's just the hours that you do and the craft that they have there is yeah like, man it's so it's complicated just, it's it's yeah. too hard. But the thing is, I, I was for about a month I was doing the uh, time restricted eating thing. Oh, and yeah. that was amazing. Man. So eating like every sixteen hours or something like that is that it was thing? exactly sixteen. So okay. I did like eight sixteen, and and so I That's typically I typically tend to gravitate towards just eating well anyway. It's like piles of vegetables and you know I I, I you know I me, don't. whatever you don't but even I'll if you do pogos for like seven days a week. Oh yeah, pogos and right, lemonade though. I get all the food groups. <laughs> That's really not man. I'm so bad. Nothing in pogos <laughs> is any one of the food groups, bro. I don't know where it's That's bad. I don't know why I'm still alive. Yeah. But I mean, I guess you just have a really fast Incredibly metabolism. Incredibly good genetics. Yeah. Thanks to my ancestors, I have yeah. no part of but this. But at one point, you're gonna start s- oh, yeah, seeing yeah, that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> like, when you hit that moment yeah. where you're like, oh wait, I have a tiny bit more fat. Oh yeah, yeah. I got you it. gotta stop, man. I got it. I got but it. but the time restricted eating thing was is amazing because yeah. it, and and it was doubly effective for me because I tend to eat well anyway. So basically, it was like I'll eat from noon to eight. Um, at any point like uh, you can eat as much as you want I would just eat my three meals in that window oh. and then at 8 p.m. I would stop and then fast for from 8 p.m. till the following day at noon and the idea there is like um, like you eliminates your stuff is that but basically what it does is um, so you fully digested the last thing that you ate okay that, that you've eaten uh, 12 hours after you've eaten it so let's say I had my last meal at 8 a.m. Uh, at 8 p.m. Well, technically, at 8 a.m. the following day, oh, okay. I fully digested the last thing I ate, and so the next four hours from 8 a.m. to noon, I'm in ketosis, which is the period where, and you should science it more than I am now, because I kind of, it, I was, it was explained to me in a very scientific way and all yeah, that yeah, stuff, yeah. but it kind of, you know, one year out the other. Well, you but, understood it one way, and that's what stuck with exactly. you. Exactly. So, but basically, ketosis is a period in which you, your body is done burning sugars, yeah. and it goes into your fat reserves. And so for four hours, that's like kind of the optimal zone that you want to be in. And I think the fat kind of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the fat kind of holds on to some like negative, uh, 
not bacteria, but like enzymes or just the bad that, stuff probably clings on there and it's like a bit of a that much I don't know. I've heard it's also a bit of a like clean out period not just fat yeah, yeah, yeah not well, because, just because the thing fat, is like when you're in cleansing. ketosis your body is producing enzymes called ketones okay uh, I don't know if they're enzymes but you're producing ketones and that's the cleansing thing mm. so that's why it's even like apparently like people do like day long fasts mm. and like, I've hey. heard about the the positive aspects of fasting yeah uh, I, it really worked for me though. I personally practiced, it, practiced uh, fasting unbeknownst to myself I'll just be editing for eight hours and then I'm yeah. like whoa I didn't eat and yeah. then I'm like, <laughs> that happens and then I'm like there's the nothing time. in the fridge and I'm like ah, I'll eat tomorrow that'll happen on set <laughs> I'll be like I haven't eaten for 32 hours what the fuck uh, <laughs> not that long there but like hours I'll just set. kind of be like we'll, we'll finally have called rap and yeah. I'll be like oh yeah I didn't eat or drink it hits you in the face eh? you're just like Phew. and you feel whoa. like shit yeah. and now you feel it and you're like whoa. yeah exactly there's but, uh, uh, well, no. you know, I think one of that factor is the fasting human behavior when because humans did not have this much food ever like no. until like the last that's why maybe it's, it's 50 coming years. back to a natural state doing this fasting thing because you the three meals a day thing yeah. is a is a common society myth we invented of that course. to yeah, gather yeah. around the table it not was, just that but also to, to to be able to have like to wake up at a certain time go to the factory come back home like exactly we've restructured exactly. our life tempo and whatever around yeah. this three meals a day thing but it's people act like fucking Moses came down the mountain with that on a tablet. It's like, thou will have three meals a day. And you're like, well, it's not a thing set in stone, man. It's just a thing we told ourselves. Yeah. Among many other things that when you think about it more, you're like, wait, yeah. that's a human construct. Uh, it is. A, a recent human construct. Very fucking um, recent, yeah. And, and here's an interesting thing, too, is that fasting it brings out, also there's a lot of people attributing it to really high levels of focus, right? Because here's what's interesting. Yeah. Uh, is that we haven't had this much abundance of food until very recently. Before, we had to be alert and look for food. And like, maybe I can pick the berries. Back when we were maybe I can work no ads, bro. Yeah, exactly. That's how we're supposed to be. I kind of agree with it. It is. Um, well, and that's, I'm getting so much joy these days of just fucking off to the woods and just going yeah, camping. Yeah, I saw that. Man. Like, why, why, do, why, do you think, why do you think that's such a cleansing thing, experience? Yeah, a couple reasons. Um, I go on adventures. I my my body is used physically for direct reasons, yes. not working for the man. I'm directly like I'm cutting something. I'm like I'm gonna use this. Squawk, put it in the fire. And yeah. I'm like yes, I did this. Like it's direct. You get a direct response to everything you do with your body. That's empowering, right? You did this. Like it feels good. Uh, you're going on an adventure. You're facing the unknown. You don't know what's ahead of you. You have fear. You're adventuring. You're in, you're responsible. You're in control of everything. I get reminded that life wants to fuck me and kill me at all times. Yeah. Everything. Because uh, I don't do like regular camping. I don't like to just have water and go to the bathroom. Like I go out in the woods. And um, like you don't dry your clothes. Tomorrow is going to be so goddamn motherfucking uncomfortable. Like yeah. you could e even get a hypothermia. Don't tie up your bag up on a fucking rope there. The bear might come and fuck with you. Or kill you. There's a lot of things you got to deal with. And you're reminded constantly like... Life is a hardcore motherfucker, and then you come home and you're comfortable, and it just there's something about it that's powerful. But but, but I, I, I think it also is because we're perhaps not meant to be in a jungle of fucking concrete and steel, and that's why when you retreat to that, that's why it's such a sought after thing to go and reconnect mm -hmm. with nature. Yeah, that's why, man, because we're actually in our habitat. That's yeah. what we're supposed to be. Yeah. I, I think that's why it's such a cleansing sought after thing. Everybody goes, ah, oh, Santa Daddy down into the country. I want to yeah. go to the country. I want to go camping. Why? Yeah. I, it's because. Well, I think I think so. Meant to or not meant to, humans are not meant to do shit. We're not meant for anything. The thing is that humans are the result of evolution, and yeah. the evolution has been influenced by outside factors and by personal fact, uh, not personal but technological factors that we've created, right? So we've sort of adapted to our technological influences over time, and we're slowly adapting to them. Um, so, yes, for the longest period of time, we've gone to the, we were in the woods. Um, but, however, we've tripled our life expectancy by being in the cities. Okay, but, and, but, but and how many of those years? Stuff, how many? Right? It's so like it's how many of those years pull. that we've added to the forty-year mark, which is when everyone will fucking die? Yeah. That was average. Are they healthy years? Honestly, the, the 40 to 60 years, pretty goddamn healthy. 40 to 60, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, okay, sorry. So I, there's so at least a 20 of healthy, and there's like another like 
20 on average because now we're at 80 years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's, what, that's decent. What I mean. It's decent, though. Of course. I, I don't want to die at 80. I'll probably do something stupid when I'm 60. Right. But, but also, also, one thing that's happened in modern society is chronic pains and yeah. all that shit that are due to sedentary lifestyle. All this, like, the thing is, like, you know, th- th- I mean, there obviously there's a lot of, you know, people who are healthy, yeah. you know, 80, 90 year olds or whatever. Yeah. But the thing is also the whole, like, you know, going, living until I'm 80, but the last 10 years were, yeah, I couldn't yeah. stand. Struggling and, yeah. yeah. I, I had, I, I'm pumped full of fucking medicines. And I shit fucking that. find it the most depressing thing in the that's world. That's what I'm saying. So, you yeah. know, it's super celebrated to yeah. the, the life expectancy thing, yeah. but I don't know that that's such well, a great Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. thing. So, so what we're doing is we're pushing the forefront. The final years are garbage. I mean, the final years when, when you were 40 back in 1440, uh, they were garbage. They, so, yeah, um, probably we're pushing great. the forefront, but the years before are progressively getting better and better, and we're evolving to a higher level of I mean, like, we're probably, like, two generations away from being immortal. Like, the, in terms of <laughs> age science. Oh, yeah. Age science. That's close, man. That's you want to know close. why? You want to know why? Artificial intelligence is why. Because we're probably about maybe 20 years. If you, if you evaluate, like, the most pessimistic views of all the experts, like, we're maybe 20 years away from sentient, like, real artificial intelligence. And when artificial intelligence... I don't factor, see how that immortalizes us. Though. Well, here's how. Uh, because artificial intelligence is, is... Well, technology progresses at a... Non-linear, so this is linear, yeah, 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 right? It, it's yeah. exponential. Yeah. So the thing is that once you have artificial intelligence, then artificial intelligence will will get exponentially better, mm. really fast, mm. right? And uh, when once you tackle, once you take the artificial intelligence and you make it tackle really hard issues, like for example life expectancy, if you put it onto that, it's going to find solutions very fast, and they're going to get overwhelmingly disconnected to our level of knowledge very fast. So I think that we're like two, three generations is like, is like two hundred years from now. Oh, uh, uh, imagine a world. Well, two, three generations, yeah. Okay, so we're not talking about the same time because a generation to me is like, you know. I might be getting it wrong in terms of the. the, Yeah, yeah. 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 Um. A hundred years from. Centuries. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a hundred to a hundred. That that I can go with you on for sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, basically, if our so two or three generations, you're right, would be basically my grandchildren. Exactly. Um, that's why I was saying that's yeah, yeah, mad yeah. close, man. I think at the end of my grandchildren's life, there is a chance that there will be immortality. Like, but in what way, though? Like, in, in what way? Because the science on, on aging is like a very big obsession in scientific. Like, it's a very big you obsession. You mean like we're art? Because you mean like our actual. Like our minds there's, being there's, immortal, or like well, either encapsulating our our minds and putting in into a medium that'll live forever, or reversing aging. There's been like a lot of research into reversing aging. Uh, they've reverse aged uh, cells in lab grown human cells. I think recently, uh, if I'm not mistaken, don't quote me on that one. I'm not hundred percent sure on it. Not even close. Um, but they've done it in mice. Uh, there's there's like some interesting like stuff going on there. That's we're so goddamn far from yeah. being able to reverse age a complex on the path. body like a human, but add artificial intelligence to that, and you don't yeah. understand how fast we're going to get to it. I don't know if that's it's, fucking shit's going to get trendy, weird. Man. I don't think so. Don't we wouldn't be there either. if we didn't just fucking stay nomadic, man. I don't know either. I'm terrified by all these prospects. If we just, <laughs> if we just stayed picking fucking berries yeah. and throwing spears through mammoths, but the we thing wouldn't is, be fucking with this. But the man. thing is, we would be just as well. But off. the thing is, no, because because your girlfriend would have died because she stepped on the wrong thing. But that's fine because we, <laughs> Why is it we fine? just talked about the random the randomness of life that can happen tomorrow too. Anyways, man, I don't think the not odds of that much, are. No, not as I don't much, think. No. Dude, we have traffic, cars, buildings no, no, that no, are no. being life, built. Life expectancy dude. is 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 overwhelmingly better if you look at the human uh, uh, birth. Uh, birth rate that's like, expectancy uh, but not happiness uh, birth deaths I mean like uh, stuff like that like but what I mean is like happiness yeah you're right but like your life ex- like chances of dying and having so much death around you compared to like what it was before like we are sheltered but is it, and we're is good. It? how I, good I is it I agree I like a little risk I, I but, agree yeah, but, but also you're, okay so but I think there's like a distinction to be made between uh, expectancy and happiness because yeah. it's a I think it's a myth to say that the quality of life has 
ex just because we have computers and phones and yeah. you know copy whatever we want it like I in don't in terms of your day to day happiness like how do we know that it's that different how do we know because we're not you know there's evidence again from sapiens yeah. there's evidence that you know they had fun they played games yeah, right. they had pets they had there was, there was a domestic life and who's to say just because agriculture came around mm -hmm. and it won out Who's to say that we're happier than those people back well, then? Well, I think I understand that yeah. a fucking saber-toothed tiger might just grab your, like, yeah. eat your ball sack or whatever. <laughs> but like, what, like those fucking saber-toothed tigers, yeah, like, the ball sacks. But, but, you know, but back then, yeah. I bet you that was just the same as like, yeah, like, yeah, it was just what happened. But like, it was yeah, the same as the like, street and get killed by a car. Yeah, like when you turn on the news, yeah. like this, some horrible thing happened to somebody who's dead. Yeah. That was the, the equivalent of that. Was like, yeah, saber-toothed tiger, I think, or whatever. I think. Here's the thing. I think we're we're faced with a very unique problem as humans is that every single thing on earth is a hundred percent the process and result result of the process of evolution every single thing. yeah yeah uh and we're the first ones that we know of maybe dolphins uh who understand our position in the world and who understand things and analyze them and, and try to ask ourselves questions to modify it yeah, and whatever yeah, yeah. and we've developed philosophy and science and blah blah, blah. but i think our primal goal because evolution is the primal goal, is to pass on our genes, is yeah. to survive, is to... And what we've been doing is just finding the processes that make us maximize the chances of survival through the edge, like, evolutionary pressure. Yeah, yeah. So, what is good? What should we seek out? Should we seek out evolution to win? Or, once we've found a certain degree of comfort, should we just sort of camp there and be like... This is good. Like, let's but, but stop that's, progression. that's kind of an oxymoron, though, because that certain level of comfort was kind of attained via evolution. Yeah, yeah, I don't think exactly. there's any point where we go, "That's it, we're done." Exactly. You know what I mean? And that's why I argued that. I mean, we're in this. And I get fuck. it, but, but I think <laughs> I think what they what what the guy was arguing for in in Sapiens was, but what if? And I guess this is when we're dealing with evolution. It's kind of hard to argue. But the thing is, what if we a mistake there. was made yeah. by yeah. settling down yeah, yeah, and yeah. then evolution took over from there, you yeah. know? Because the thing is, we, I guess in the hardship of having to, because you know, they, when we were nomadic and hunter-gatherers, well, they're just at one point that we, we ran the mammoths away yeah. and there was just no food for a while yeah. and then there would be famines. But I mean, the fucking Irish potato famine. There was one in the 20th century. Yeah. But anyways, like, I, I just I think... I love how it always comes back to it. <laughs> it does, man. <laughs> but, the, but the thing yeah. is, like, I, I think, like... I um, think that's what these wars are, too, is that we overconsume things, and then we come up to a scarcity. After World War II, we had uh, we had the New World Deal, right? Where this country yeah. had this much resources After World War II. Yeah. yeah. We separated the world's resources. Like, oh, you get to own Africa. <laughs> like, stuff like... We're yeah, kind of yeah, dicks yeah. like that, and that's what we did. And, um, but we end up just burning up too many resources and then we kind of have to burn the forest down for stuff to regrow. It's a weird phenomenon. But also, but, well, what, but what right, happens yeah. in that is new systems are put together. Exactly. So, for example, exactly. to battle, to combat, like people were just like, look, I'm fucking tired of it. Like, look, look, my kids died. Yeah. Like, I had two fucking families and they, they, they keep dying because we have no food. So, yeah. how about we just settle down? And ha like let's just farm this wheat in industrial. Qu yeah, yeah, it's evolution. Yes, it'll lead us to, to death until we stabilize. But yeah, but I'm just I'm just like trying to think like you know because the thing is, it, it was very quick mm -hmm. after that decision to settle down. Yeah, it was very quick to then form these large societies that at one point, even if because the thing is like you know the dependence on one crop was not good for a long time yeah. because if that was wiped out by some natural disaster, yeah. you're fucked, man, Completely because fucked. now you, you're, you don't have hunters anymore. Yeah. No one knows how to do that. Yeah. And you're, the fucking tsunami just wiped out all your shit, so yeah. people died just as much. And so the thing is, like, what, what but I... But that's evolution telling you spe specialization is not a, a, a good process. And then when you get out of it, you, 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 know, you spread out your resources, and then you get better at chances of survival. It's like it's a weird evolutionary yeah. process where like we learn by fucking dying by the millions, but yeah, it's a gnarly process. I guess I forgot the point I was gonna I was gonna keep making with the whole like oh shit. With uh, the, oh yeah, no, no, but yeah. so, so like you know, so like being sedentary, mm -hmm. like adopting agriculture in the first couple of years, 
there was such a drastic swell of the population number of these tribes. And the thing is, like at some point, yeah. when you've put all of your eggs in that one basket, even if you want it to turn back, uh, it, it's just too late because yeah, everything yeah, yeah. was put into agriculture and you've kind of stopped adopting your the techniques of old. Yeah. And the thing is, like, you know, in the first, like, in the the first like agricultural settlements there would be like diseases would just fucking ravage them. Yeah. Not just not just the crops, but yeah. also because you're Humans. living in such close and proximity. And they were used to having this much close proximity epidemics. to so many people. Exactly. Yeah. It would it would make epidemics easier yeah. to live on yeah. because it, there was just so many more people and the crops and all that stuff. So I yeah, I just, I just I don't know man, sometimes I just I'm sitting in traffic man and I'm just I'm in like two hour traffic to get 14 feet to get to fucking work. Uh, and I just yeah. go, I'm just, oh, yeah, I'm yeah, sitting yeah. in this fucking line of honking <laughs> hot metal. Yeah. Everyone, I feel the energy of traffic now. Yeah. And like, I just kind of go, this is unnatural. Yeah. We're not supposed to be in this, in a fucking yeah. metal box. Angry. I fucking despise the person in front of me. <laughs> like, For no reason, man. <laughs> yeah. I hate them so much yeah, yeah. because they're just, they didn't go. Because that one time they didn't go when they were supposed yeah, to go. like the cars in front inched up. He didn't inch up for like five seconds and I hate this man's soul. <laughs> and it makes no sense. Yeah. But it's because I just think about the, because I get really metaphorical when I'm sitting there in traffic yeah, because I hate so it so profoundly. Because you have so much time to think and you, know, and you, have time, yeah. you go deeper into it. Yeah, and I just get into this kind of crazy whirlpool of hate and I just get out of it going, I don't think I'm supposed to be sitting in fucking traffic, man. Yeah. In this steel, this city made of steel. Like, it's just not right. Yeah. And sometimes I, I just, I get really weird, man, when I think about that kind of shit. And I kind of Well, think I think the like, world's adapted faster than we have by far. I think that's the conflict, is that we have not adapted fast enough for the world. And, and we're trying to understand it and deal with it and evolution is a slow process and evolution works one graveyard it's gonna get time. worse because AI is fucking exponential like you're saying so we're I'm never saying. gonna catch up man That's what I'm saying I'm, I'm very much uh, worried about AI I've been a proponent of technology and AI for the longest time now I'm at a place where I'm like should we go down that road or like we're good right now like I can't believe the amount of people who complain about all, like there's so many things that people complain about where I'm like, have you traveled? Have you seen the world? Yeah. Like, have you, do, have you read a history book? Like, have you, like we are so overwhelmingly good right now on every issue compared to any moment in any time, in any society, in any, like, yeah. so artificial intelligence is one of those things, like should we go down that road? Like we're pretty good right now. I think the main concern could get though, worrying. I, I think the main concern in saying like we're good right now, though, to me would be because I there's get, still stuff to solve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but I, I get saying that in terms of like deep into that. I, I think I, I get saying that in terms of like technology yeah. and whatever else, econ whatever. But I think the main concern should be just like like happiness, and I don't mean that in like course, a hippie dippy way. I just yeah, mean yeah. like is the human condition generally Satisfying. in a good place? Yeah. And I, I don't. Well, I think I, don't know I think that's is. mostly a cultural shift that needs to be made. We have all the technology available to be able to sustain any of this happy state or optimally happy state. Because I don't think we can achieve happiness ever. Uh, I that's think true. I think meaning is is the thing that's the most important. If you don't have meaning, you don't have happiness. Because you so, eat a chocolate yeah. cake and like after the second bite, you're like, oh my god, this is good. But after the third bite, you're like, yeah, I could get some milk. Right, yeah, like we're yeah. forever on that's that. That's that natural human refresh rate, because man. There's it's so goddamn important evolutionarily for us to be dissatisfied with stuff. That's why we seek other things, and yeah. So it's just so ingrained with us to be unhappy that I think we have the technology right now that is so overwhelmingly advanced. What we should do is just like slow down in terms of how much resources we consume, and have a cultural shift and look at like, okay, how should we be living our life? Because there's a lot of depression. There's a lot of these like. So that's what I mean, like, in terms of, like, stopping, like, we should chill out here. I don't mean, like, let's just, this is good, like, let's stop no, here. I, I like, agree with you, a cultural shift. I feel shift. we should have a cultural shift, I, and I we think, should analyze stuff. I but think, intelligently, please. Yeah. You know? I think one one area that I would, like, kind of lobby for in mm -hmm. terms of, like, where, like, what type of cultural shift, cultural yeah, yeah. shift there should be is maybe a bit of funding or awareness made towards stuff like meditative practices and yeah, i think what we talked about i want to get into that yeah, yeah like that well, that that is huge man yeah. like i think if a lot of people understood the benefits of that and like what meditation or just any meditative yeah. practice is 
I think that would be huge, man, because that would be everyone finding their meaning. It's been tarnished with uh, the hippie shit. Yeah. It's like... Dude, that's so true. I man. tried to get into yoga, and, like, I, I just cringe too hard every time. Like, I feel like my muscles are relaxed, but, like, my cringe muscles are, like, so tense. Like, yeah, man. You're, uh, you're right that it's it's been commandeered yeah. by but negative there's some connotations. very big wealth of, of value there. There's a lot of value I there think so. in and, terms and, of and understanding like I said, yourself. It's not necessarily and, just sitting at yeah. Indian, closing your eyes and humming. Like it's it's actually a lot more than that. And I don't even necessarily mean meditation itself yeah. because a meditation is just a means to get you to a meditative state. Mm. But you can get to a meditative state doing the sport you love yeah. or whatever. I totally. just think that meditation is like the more direct highway towards that, but you can take a funner highway. That's the um that's the debate right now is the that's the approach of improving the self instead of improving society as a whole. Yeah. So instead yes. of dictating like yes. we need to do this, it's saying, "Hey, how about every individual has a practice that makes them better individually?" But that's a hard and side I because of what you're saying. I agree with because it. Because of the I anti-movement agree. against that. Yeah. I don't really know. Like, I, I guess... Well, that, no, but I mean, that that specifically, yes, you're right. That's an issue with it. But it ties into the global concept of, right now we're debating, uh, it's either your your race, your cult, your, your yeah. sex and all of that, and you're a group and you're, you're part of a group identity, or you're an individual. So it's very much right now, the, the we're in a culture war, I think. It's the group versus the individual. And I think the individual should win because anything that is group is teams yeah, and, and yeah, we attack exactly. each other and it's not good and it's dangerous and there, we should focus on each other individually and better ourselves and I think that's well, one thing that I, one thing that I've noticed is I I've gifted people float sessions <laughs> <laughs> yo yeah best. yeah exactly and which is again yeah. a fucking meditative practice absolutely uh, I, I've gifted three or four like a, a bunch of people it's mm-hmm. uh, uh, a practice. generous gift dude none of them did it yeah, none of them did it. Because they it, think it's too hippie shit or what? No, no, not not them. It's just like a, a lot of people, uh, I think, are against s- the idea of it. Sitting there, closing your eyes and dealing they with your thoughts. They think it's going to be boring. No. No, no, no. It's the dealing yeah. with your thoughts. Because the thing is, like with meditation, is you, gotta, you, you sit there and you close your eyes. And before you get to that the bottom of the ocean floor level, yeah. which is where you want to be, yeah. you got to deal with the oh. firing of your own thoughts. And a lot of people, especially being locked in a box, floating there, yeah. like, especially the idea of that, people really don't want to do that. And uh, I'm telling you, man, every person I've gifted that to has not done it. Wow. And again, I think it's because of the claustrophobia you thing, but gift, I... You can gift me. <laughs> okay, fuck it. Yo, I'll, find I wanna... I'll find the goddamn coupon and give it to you. <laughs> I love float tanks. I think they're just... Yeah. Fuck super impressive phenomenon just the fact that you teleport to another universe like it really after if you do it well like you're able to really feel like you're just completely disconnected and then your thoughts start rolling and then you're just like it's a hell of an experience it's, it, the idea is to like I, the most fascinating thing with meditation for me is sitting in the chair mm-hmm. and for, for the, the thing that i used to do and like I, I still do it from time to time i did it a couple of weeks ago but when i first started doing it i did it for like two years straight and it was transcendental meditation. So I had a mantra that I would do and close my eyes twice a day, 20 minutes. Hmm. And like when I got um, the, the, the practices before you start the mantra, you can't just like, you know, sit down from your school day. Uh, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah. You just start doing it. You got to oh, yeah. sit there for two, three minutes and just let your thoughts fire. Yeah, right, so. And the, a really crazy thing that happens is when you're just letting your thoughts play out, you actually start to realize that you're not the one conjuring these thoughts into your mind. Because you, you sit there and then you'll just think of a giraffe. <laughs> and then you're going to think of that time you ate jello once. <laughs> and then the shower you took where you saw a guy fall and it was weird. Yeah. Like, whatever. And, yeah. you're, and you, you tell yourself, wait, I didn't call these up. Why the yeah. fuck are they? And it's just because your thoughts just work that way, man. Mm. And, and then you realize that. And then yeah. you're like, whoa, okay. And then it brings you to somewhere else. And exactly. Then... Well, so the thing is you let your thoughts fizzle out. And then at one point, it's in after two minutes, you then start the mantra. And you allow your thoughts to just fire at, at, at will. And then at one point, you're just in a zone where it's just the mantra. And there's mm. nothing. There's no thought. And it me- meditative state is just, I think the definition is my own definition. Mm-hmm. But I think the definition of it is is you're at a point where your awareness is fully interior. Yeah. Because, like, at any given moment when you're not doing a meditative state, like right now, my awareness is largely exterior, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm, 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 there's stimuli, the, the lights yeah. in my face, yeah, yeah. there's my, my skin, I, I got an itch, you know, like all you're that picking stuff. picking up my social cues, there's a bunch there's of stuff. There's so much shit, and my, that so means that my awareness is outside, and it's 
usually yeah. like that for people their entire lives. But if you take a moment, mm -hmm. I think, to travel within to the point where it's, because basically your thought, I think like the, the way that my TM guy instructed me on how to get to that level, because I had to like sit and do like guided meditations and yeah. shit for the first like two weeks. The way that it is, is he explained it to me, and this helped me go down to every single time, which is the way that, what meditation is, is at, when your awareness is fully outside, it's like you're at the top of the ocean, and it's the, the vague, yeah, there's yeah. waves, there's wind, there's all kinds of shit, but the point that you want to get to is the bottom of the ocean floor. So up here, it could be a, there could be a storm going on in your life, mm -hmm. but down here, it's always the same. It's, it's the, yeah, no yeah, sound, it's the nothing. And that's where you want to seep into. And the mantra is just your little submarine. You know, that's that's just mm. what it is. But that could be anything. And so the point is you want it all, to, you want to be in that flow state. And that's what I define as your awareness is fully inside. And you want to stay in, so in a meditation session, you're not just going to teleport down there and stay there for 20 minutes. You're going to keep popping back out. Yeah. So at one point you're going to be there and then you're going to, you're going to be at that point and then oh, you got to itch. And then that's a little, what my guy told me is that's a little stress bubble going like that at the top from the bottom. So that's a good thing to cycle, just like sleep, you cycle. And I think that if a lot, you, what I noticed the first like two weeks that I did that, I noticed immediately that I was way less short tempered. Not that I'm mm. short tempered, but I was way less short tempered. You're short tempered, dude. I know, but I'm yeah. just saying like, no, I can be short tempered, yeah, yeah. man. No, no, I feel yeah. But the thing is, like, it was like the way I defined it was my threshold for getting pissed after I stubbed my toe on the coffee yeah. table was way more than before I started doing that, and just patience and uh, a lot of shit. But I think that if people took up a practice of getting to know themselves instead of, you know, yeah. not doing that, I think that would solve a lot of shit. I, uh, yeah, a lot of shit. I need, man. I need that to get getting in, sleep. Yeah, uh, I need to get into all of these things. Uh, so you I'm, can't for like the next well, year. Well, the thing is, I'm I'm yeah, exactly with construction and ISIS next Thursday. Yeah, um, just, you can't. Is no, the thing is, labors. I'm um, I'm like the only. I'm always a hundred percent go. Like I never chill. I don't have a chill. Like, and I need to really find that chill because I used to do extreme sports to but calm that me was down. Probably your chill. I just like ah, knock yeah. it out, and then I'd be like, oh, or I I just you're in in the air flipping your head upside down, and literally, if you think about another thing. You fuck up and it hurts so bad. You need to be a hundred percent in the moment, yeah. like or else you're fucked. So that was always my meditative thing. That's but, exactly that. But now it's dangerous. Thing. Like uh, I can't get injured. I don't have uh, insurance. Like it's all this stuff, right? Oh, I should get insurance. But, um, <laughs> get a full time job. But yeah, I, I should get into meditating, and uh, that's an avenue. I think you can replace it because I really I said, think I'm meditating is probably going to be the thing that I need because I'm I'm yeah very anxious. I overthink. I think too fast, and it, I don't have a memory. So the fact that I it's going to be gnarly so for you the first few times intimidates me because I can't remember the things I'm trying to hold on to. Yeah. So it's really something I need to get a control. I, I think that what you're going to find though, just to not to discourage you, but like it's going to be really hard for you the oh, first couple times. Yeah. Just don't get. You know, don't get bogged down by that because it's you're not gonna that state that you got to get to. You have to get to it the first couple of times to understand and what then it takes see the meaning and the value of it. And, but also how the, like okay, how to get, get there. You know, and like what to not get bogged down or distracted yeah. by because you can go through full sessions, whatever it is you do. Because you know, there's like breathing meditation. There's a lot of yeah. different types. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, um, you have to to. Um, to not to understand what not to get bogged down by. So like let's say you can go through a whole twenty minute session of doing TM and never get there, yeah. but at least you put in the time. And you're getting a little deeper. The submarine's going That's a little exactly, deeper, right? Exactly. Until you finally find the beautiful horizon where you're like, yeah. wow, look at this. Place. I remember man, the, great it is. the first time that happened was in a guided thing. The mm. first few, I was like, I, I didn't get there. I fucked this shit. I'd be but, too weird with a guide in the beginning. There'd be no chance. I'd yeah, but you know, it should. Eventually, you probably. Yeah, when you get good, yeah. you could do it at at a fucking at a municipal yeah. Yeah, man, like, <laughs> rush hour. It wouldn't matter. <laughs> Yeah. That's if you get good. But the thing is, like, I remember the first time I did it in a group sesh, yeah. I was like, I think something happened. I didn't know what it was. I was probably there for a microsecond. What? Yeah. Uh, battery almost died. Oh, dude. We saved it. You were there for a microsecond? Yeah, I was, I was there for, for like a microsecond, and, and then I popped out of it, and I was like, I think, and then I described it to the dude, and he was like, yeah, that's, that's it, man. You just got to keep doing it, and at mm -hmm. one point, you're going to be able to spend 30 seconds there, and then a minute there, and then two minutes there. And when you do that, whatever meditative practice you do, when you get there and you pop out of it, you're fucking refreshed and you mm -hmm. feel fucking great. So, All right. Well, here's 
another thing that I find quite meditative is these really deep conversations. That is, you can go yeah. into like three hours into them, yeah, and then like whoop, you pop out of it and you're like, oh, the real world. Oh, we're oh heat. Oh, it's cool here. Oh, the light here. Yeah. I don't know how yeah. much time we've done, but it was a cool conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We I think cut it let's cut it. I want to keep the conversation going. Yeah. But let's at least cut it because our spectators are like, dude, can you shut the fuck yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> just browse through. But it. thanks for being there. Yeah, my pleasure, man. <laughs>